monthly uh, general the general monthly meeting for Community Board Two. Um, I am Lenny Singletary. I serve as the chair of the board. And this evening, you are not seeing my face. I am focusing on being a good driver, so I'm communicating hands free. But we also have um, our first vice chairperson, Mr. Leonard Jordan, our second vice chairperson, Barbara Zala Gringer, and we have Jessica Thurston, who serves as our secretary. Um, everyone should have had the opportunity to receive the agenda for this evening. And we'll start with the first item, which is a welcome. So thank you, I've done that. A review of the agenda and the meeting protocols, which has taken place. And so are there any um, noted corrections to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, seeing none, please indicate your support for the agenda by either raising your hand or indicating aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Are there any abstentions? Thank you. The next item on the agenda for tonight is a review of the minutes from our March 2022 meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from March 2022? Are there any modification or any edits? Hearing none, uh, should anyone have any edits at a later date, please feel free to send them to the office. And in that case, I'll ask any all those in favor of accepting the minutes as presented, raise your hand or indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Please do so following the same protocol. Any abstentions? Okay, great, thank you. Um, I also wanna mention as the next agenda item is, this is where we um, open up to the community, to non-community board two members, to after reviewing the agenda, if there are any items of interest you would like for us to be made aware of or things that any of the respective committee chairs or co-chairs should address or points that you wanna to bring to the attention of community board two. I also encourage you as the, a sense of normal protocol, should anything of a nature arise that you want CB, CB2 to be aware of, I encourage everyone to continue to work through our board office. Um, the office does an excellent job in addressing uh, constituent comments and concerns. So with that, let me pause to see if there are any com concerns from the community. Okay, hearing, hearing none, we'll keep the agenda as designed. And then what we'll do now is we'll proceed with the uh, chairperson's report. So a, a few things. One, um, I am not going to chair the full portion of the meeting tonight. I have a conflict. And so I thank everyone for allowing me to move the agenda, uh, my report up in the agenda. The meeting will be uh, continued on by the first vice chair, Mr. Leonard Jordan. However, I am um, sent out a notice recently to everyone with regard to the election of the new district manager as per our bylaws. And as you all may recall, we did this uh, on March 24th. Part of the problem is that on March 24th, um, we barely had quorum. Quorum for this community board is 25 people, right? And so we had 26. And understanding that you know people have obligations and commitments no one is made to feel bad by my statements. However, we have a job to do and our bylaws direct us to do that job. And so here we are yet again in an environment where we need to select a district manager. I sent out a notice and respectfully asked for people to confirm their participation. That has not happened. I do not have any emails indicating that we will have quorum for the scheduled meeting on the 19th. And so I asked two things of my fellow board members. One, that you respond to my email indicating your attendance. Two, that you make every effort to make this meeting. It is important that we conduct this business for the betterment of the individuals we serve and for the betterment of community board too. And last but not least, I ask that everyone please be prepared in advance and come prepared to have a a supportive discussion 
in support of what we're trying to accomplish, but then also let's have an open dialogue. I don't want people to feel like they can't um, have a voice, but let's do it in a respectful and a collegial manner as is consistent with the way we've always done our business. And so that's a point I definitely would like to highlight. Number two is part of my report. Um, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, as I mentioned before, has continued and continues engaged in a dialogue where they are looking to provide uh, a solution to, to the gun violence that is taking place within Brooklyn, but most notably in our district. And so um, crime statistics, while they're not totally um, in a context of panic, but we still have enough incidents that happen within our district between the 84th precinct and the 88th precinct that requires us to still remain diligent and concerned. And so I applaud the district attorney's office and his community liaison and his colleagues for making sure that um, they're doing their part and enlisting the support of community board too and other stakeholder leaders as we try to put a dent in some of those concerns that exist within our, our community, within our district. And, and my last point I wanna mention this evening is that as we get to a point where there's some spike in the numbers relative to the pandemic um, and to the coronavirus, I would ask people to continue to please be um, diligent, be smart. It is good that Brooklyn is nowhere near the numbers that um, level and change the way we engage in, in um, full engagement. We are still at a point where we're safe from a health perspective. And so that's a good thing. Um, that's another reason, which, which is why we've made the decision to have the next meeting, uh, which is a special call meeting on the 19th in person, one to meet the requirements of the bylaws, but furthermore, because we're in a still safe environment from a, a COVID-19 perspective. I encourage everyone to continue to be smart and do what's best for you and for your health. And I'm sorry, the last thing I'm gonna mention, what my previous statement was gonna be my last thing, but the last thing I wanna mention is that you should all be aware of an email that was sent out from the board office indicating that the governor has extended the ability for community boards to have virtual meetings through um, the end of June. And I think the way this coincides, it would be the date of the last general body meeting for June. Um, I'm sorry, the general body meeting in June. And typically what we try to do is take July and August off. And so if all things hold true, um, it will at least get us through this first portion of our meeting season. So with that, that concludes my report. I'll pause, should anyone have any questions or anything that you'd like to discuss based on what I just mentioned? Fantastic. So the next item on the agenda is that of a presentation. And so is the presenter here? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you doing? I'm doing well. So thank you for your presentation. Relax, be calm, you're, you're amongst um, friendly faces and the floor is yours. Please introduce yourself. Sure thing, of course, let me get it shared to y'all. Okay, would somebody mind telling me if they can see it? Looks great, Samantha. Great, thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Samantha. I am a Fund for the City Planning Fellow. Um, this is my project I did for Community Board 2 Brooklyn. It is a set of data analysis mappings. So with that, I'll begin. Um, so I wanted to start off with some mindful centering. Um, I'm mindful of the need for further analysis mindful of the need for community-based survey research. I'm mindful data is not 100% accurate and is inherently has bias that can misrepresent. I'm mindful these are just beginning steps towards advocation and change for the community. Um, I really wanna lead and communicate with mindfulness. So entering this presentation, these are just a few thoughts I had and I wanted to communicate. I'm aware of these limitations and ask that all questions be held to the end of the presentation. Um, and if needed, you can add them to the Zoom chat and I'll address at the end. Um, moving on. Oops, sorry. So uh, my project was processing updated 2020 US Census data through QGIS to provide Community District 2 Brooklyn 
with comp comparative data analysis mappings that locate disparities within the district census tracts. Ultimately, the visual mapping will be used to help guide elected officials, CBOs, and other stakeholders in making future planning and funding decisions. From the beginning of the project, general district data was searched based off known district needs and requests. This was research information presented on the, at the previous meeting I attended. Um, from this research, the most evident areas in, in need of exploration were in, income averages, population demographics, and unexpectedly finding uh, senior poverty rates that were extremely high that I wanted to explore further. As this is, was evident problem based off data, there's little focus in the statement of needs for this. Uh, before looking into the topic, uh, look, looking into the data, I want to note that the study does not include the margin of error data. Uh, the null census tracts are included in these areas. The null data tracts are ones with a little population to no population response. And the 2011 inflation adjustment is included in this data. So starting off just from this initial mapping of community district two, Brooklyn median income, you already see striking differences in census tracts, but really let's look at the figures. Uh, we have the highest median in census tract 21 at 228,000 and right located right next to it is the lowest median in census tract 23 at 18,000. Uh, from the beginning, the striking visual representation alone calls for further research, inquiry and action. Uh, we also have close by census tracts 29.01 and 185.01 located within Fort Greene, which are also showing very low. Uh, looking into this at a, with a wider eye, uh, we see here in that CD2 Brooklyn being compared to Kings County overall. While we still see noticeable differences in the areas explored on the last slide, the importance is in the data itself. Um, in comparison, we see that CD2 Brooklyn uh, census tract 21 is the highest median income census tract of all Kings County, um, as well as lowest is placed 14th in all of Kings County, uh, not including the null tracts, of course. Again, this is a striking contrast that alone calls for more community-based research on how to best address and aid this area. Uh, from these findings, I wanted to take a look kind of into the, the poverty rates because so we can kind of explore that, that difference. Uh, still looking at New York census tracts, here we see as expected an almost complete reverse of the, the previous map, uh, with the lowest households below poverty level percentage in tract 5.02 in Brooklyn Heights at less than 2%, and the highest percentage unsurprisingly in tract 23 at just under half of households uh, below the poverty line at 49.4%. Um, census tract 23 is the 14th highest percentage in all Kings County, while 5.02 is the third lowest percentage in all Kings County. So again, we have these extreme opposing sides of scales. Uh, moving on after that initial general data research and researching income levels, I knew I wanted to dive deeper into age demographics, specifically that of senior age 65 and plus, which is the, uh, considered to be the economically inactive. From the initial findings and the general data research that called attention to seniors living below poverty. Here we see general median ages within Kings County. As predicted, the age median rises uh, the further from the city. What drew my attention here is that the darker shade in, in the district of, in Brooklyn Heights and Cobble Hill area. Uh, so investigating this further, I wanted to map out the uh, old age dependency ratio. And you may be asking what the old age dependency ratio is. It's the uh, economically inactive versus the working age. Uh, so economically inactive is usually 65 plus while working age is considered to be 15 to 64. This is important to understand and note the change in range of the economically inactive and economically and uh, ec economically active and economically inactive population. Economically active population participates fully in taxes. A higher old age dependency ratio will also most likely show a reduced productivity growth. Uh, it is helpful in gauging what kind of resources are really needed in a particular area, like senior healthcare access and other resources. 26.7% and above is the threshold for increasing senior long term care facilities and resources based off ArcGIS story maps. Um, so here we note the mapping a pretty widespread of percentages considered in the higher range of old age dependency ratios, particularly in Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill, Fort Greene, and Clinton Hill areas. It's kind of spread out and it's a lot higher than um, what would be uh, expected. 
Comparatively, it is noted that CD2 has higher percentages than most of Brooklyn and is closer to the city, interestingly enough, as it is more expected for higher rates the further from the city you get and for it being so close, the higher rates are something that would draw interest. Um, so taking a look at services registered available for seniors, CD2 has a pretty extensive network of service providers compared to other areas of Brooklyn which is most likely tied to the high percentage of seniors living in the district. Yet when we look at the poverty rates of seniors, we notice extremely high rates of seniors living below the poverty line, noting first the highest percentage in census tract 5.01 at 77.9% of households in that census tract living below poverty level. Directly next to it is the next highest at, in census tract one at 64.57%. And the third highest we see shaded dark is census tract 31 at 61.19%. All extremely high levels, over 50% of the senior households are living below poverty. Um, comparably to the rest of Brooklyn, census tract 5.01 ranks 15th highest, which again, we are seeing a striking comparison and concerning number. With higher rates of seniors and plenty of senior care resources, there needs to be further research and inquiry into why there remains extreme high rates of seniors living below the poverty line within the district. And concerns should be higher um, and addressed within the next statement of district needs. Um, kind of to draw it together, uh, making further connections, what other areas are influenced by these location disparities and how can you and the board use these mappings in funding and planning requests? So some other areas that can be affected are educational resource access, homelessness, uh, further healthcare access, environmental impacts, and others. So I wanted to ask if anyone can think of any other areas that may be influenced, um, as well as where can this lead the board in terms of next steps? Uh, application of findings and proposals and requests, uh, alternative forms of research and for further documentation, such as walking analysis, community member participant photography, community surveys, um, other things like that nature, and also furthering mappings. As you can see, these mappings can provide striking visual representations of the current state of disparities. Visual representation is important as it shifts the balance between perception and cognition to the brain and leaves an imprint on the viewer. It is also a quick and effective way of communicating information. Um, I also will be sharing this presentation link out and I included some links to share. Um, they, last time I was in, a couple of people had some inquiries of a uh, general demographic comparison of 2010 to the 2020 data, and a lot of these tools are really great for that. Um, the census tables are a little trickier to use if you haven't used them before, but there's some really great YouTube videos that you can easily filter and find this data. These other ones reported really are just mappings, and all you have to do is go through and it'll show you the data straight away. Um, so I'll share those out. They're really great resources. Um, and that is it. This is my contact information. If anybody has any questions or inquiries, uh, this is my email, my website, and my Instagram. Yes. Um, open to questions. Are there, are there any questions? Excellent presentation, by the way. Thank you so much you. for doing that. And it, it, it also highlights and amplifies the value add of having a, a fellow be able to focus and provide this this research. So, uh, again, opening up to board uh, to board members for questions. Thanks, Mr. Scala. Um, I see yes, your hand raised. Okay. Well, I okay. This is Carlton Gordon. Thanks. You? You can hear me. Okay. I uh, just was curious. Where is Census Twenty Three and Thirty One approximately? Uh, this is very nicely done, and thank you. Uh, but can you okay. sort of like tell us approximately what blocks or areas or some neighborhoods where Census Twenty Three and Census Thirty One are located? So I'm here. Uh, let me share them. Approximately, just you know, or maybe I, like a major I, avenue or something. I personally would share. Um, personally don't, wouldn't, I don't have the actual block names. Um, mm -hmm. I can provide a link that actually goes in, that has a map of all the census tracts laid out that you can zoom in and you can see all the different locations and it even provides street names and everything like that. So I can throw that in the chat as well. Thank you. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I believe uh, Ciro, is that? Yes, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. It's quite extensive. I just had a question. What is the um, poverty rate? What is the bar? When you say below the poverty rate, above the poverty rate, what is the bar? And is it the family poverty rate? How is that figured figured out? So um, pulled from this is pulled from the 2020 census data. Poverty rate for overall um, would be the total population. So all households, no matter family or anything like that, you can pull specific data based off of if you're married, single household, but I wanted a total population compared to then the 65 and the 65 plus is just based off of age. So it includes um, married, unmarried, single, uh, includes all of that widowed, um, but you can pull data that is a little more specific. For this, I just wanted more of a broader sense since it was the first initial research. Um, so further yeah, projects what, would look deeper into that categorizing. What is the actual, what is the actual income amount? Is there a dollar amount that you go by? So that would be based off uh, the census data. Um, for poverty rate, I believe, let me see, I had it pulled up. Oh, here, someone just is putting in the chat as well. Um, in 2019, the threshold was 36,000 in annual income for a household of four, while the federal uh, threshold was 25,000. Uh, just one more question. And when is that adjusted? Is it adjusted only at every census time or is it adjusted uh, yearly or how is that adjusted? Um, I would be guessing the data that for that I pulled was the 2020 census data. So I'm guessing they adjust it per census for that specific set. So every 10 years? Yes. Yeah. Right. I'm Thank sure there's other it. data that provides maybe shorter term. Um, right. As for census data, though, they, that is every 10 years. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I believe there was another question. Are there any additional questions from board members? No, it was already answered. Oh, great. Um, so I don't see any other hands. Again, okay, so again, thank you for the presentation. Um, again, if there are board members who have questions um, at a later time, um, I think the links will definitely be helpful to help you drill down on whatever additional information is um, insightful. And again, thank, thank you, Sam, for the presentation. Of course. I went ahead and threw in those links I was um, talking about. Um, the population one would be really great also for discerning uh, census tracts and where they are. Okay, great. Thank you. At this time in the agenda, we're up for committees for board action. And so I'm going to introduce the first committee, which is um, Health, Environment, and Social Services, Mr. Smith. And then at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to um, Mr. Jordan, who is our first vice chair to continue with leading the meeting. Have a good evening, all. Take care. Happy Easter. And pass off. Take care, Mr. Singletary. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Smith. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, the uh, Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee met last Wednesday, April 6th, 6 p.m. Uh, just quickly before I get into the liquor licenses, I'm very enthused to announce the committee is planning a health fair, which we've agreed will be June 25th at Commodore Berry Park, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Save the date. Um, really excited about that, uh, but that's not for this meeting. I just wanted to give that information out. I'm gonna to get to my items of action. My items of action are liquor licenses and we had seven of them at the, uh, uh, at the uh, meeting last week. None particularly concerning, but um, I'll go through them starting with 330 Myrtle Avenue. Uh, 330 Myrtle Avenue is uh, located, I believe, uh, Washington Park in Claremont is the location. And uh, this, uh, this establishment is a new Thai restaurant. It's gonna be uh, seven days a week, 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, full liquor, beer, uh, background music, 
neighbors agreed to it. They're, they're going to hire five people locally, uh, seven signatures of support. The uh, committee approved them unanimously, seven zero zero. Um, second liquor license, 25 bond, uh, Cafe Plus. This uh, liquor license is located, this, this establishment will be at uh, uh, bo approximately Bond and Livingston. It is uh, American cuisine, 10 a.m. to 2 a.m., seven days a week, background music only. Um, the, uh, um, there are no residents, it's a commercial building, and uh, no outdoor seating, um, 29 signatures of support. We approved it unanimously, 700. That was the same mark for the last one, too. Um, 117 Adams Street, Hungry Angelina. Uh, this is a vegan restaurant that you may know as the Et building in the uh, Dumbo area downtown. Um, the, uh, they're seeking a liquor, beer, and wine license. Um, it, the hours are 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Sunday to Wednesday, 11 to 11 on Thursday, and 11 to 12 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Again, no outdoor seating, uh, planning to hire locally 50 people. Um, we, we spoke a lot of this meeting about hiring locally, trying to hire people from um, uh, communities of, of color and trying to hire people from uh, uh, places of need in our community. Um, we, uh, uh, we approved them 700. Next up, 78 Rockwell Place. This is a coffee shop. It's called the Coffee Project. Um, the hours for this uh, place is 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. Monday through Friday and 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Um, the full liquor, uh, beer and wine. Um, and this was one of a few applications of this meeting where they had actually presented to us at, the, at a prior meeting and gotten our approval, but their application had run out because of COVID, in addition to because of COVID and, and not, um, uh, not following up in the correct period of time. Um, local residents uh, had provided support, 41 signatures of support, committee voted to approve 700. Next, we had a new beer and wine license, 491 Atlantic Avenue, Elsa's Zone. 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Um, fully indoors. This uh, application was presented exactly the same in May 2021, and they uh, they didn't uh, follow up with the liquor authority, so they 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 had to come back and renew the the license. They had 47 signatures of support. We approved them 700. 445 Albee Square West Unit F50 and 51 Pulkies. This is a kiosk at the decal market hall. This has a, a, a bit of a um, slightly lower level of review because it has no resident impact whatsoever. It's in the middle of a, of a giant food hall and it's a small kiosk. Um, nonetheless, the, uh, the uh, location got 17 signatures of support. It will be following the hours of the, uh, uh, of the, the decal market uh, food hall. Um, Finally, we have 30 Lafayette Avenue, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Um, there, there's a uh, application for a beer and wine license from 3.30 p.m. to 12 a.m. Um, and it's they're, they're, they wanna serve beer and wine in the movie theater there. 29 signatures of support, uh, approved 700. Um, None of the applications that we heard had any community concerns expressed from anyone who came to the meeting. So that, that played a role in them being unanimously approved. That's the conclusion of my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, is there any reason, does any board member have a reason that they wanna separate any of these out? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept the committee. I, I had uh, my hand raised. I'm um, sorry. I, I can't, yeah. you know, I, let me just explain to everybody. I'm on my iPad, so I can't really see everybody. So if you could 
raise your hand electronically. I guess uh, that would be better for me, okay? And uh, if I don't recognize you, just speak up like Barbara did. Okay, right. Barbara. Well, I have a question. Um, th this wine and beer license for BAM, is that to imbibe while you're sitting at a movie? Watching a movie? Correct. All right. Could we have that one set aside separately, please? Okay. Ms. Zeller-Gringer? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it helps to adjust your question. That is in response to actually a brand new type of liquor license that's available. If that inf influences your, your request. Okay. okay. Well, well, maybe we can just handle it separately and then we'll- You, you mean uh, for movie theaters? There's a special license now for movie theaters? That's correct. I would like, this is Dorothea. I'd like it to be held separately too, because I may yeah, have some- Okay. Okay. No Thank problem. you. I Hi, I don't know yeah, if it's okay for me to interject. I'm, I'm here on behalf of BAM tonight, if I can answer any questions. Um, I don't know if now is the right time. Or... Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we have to have a motion to, to uh, approve the, uh, the committee's uh, recommendations first, and then we'll go on to, uh, to that one particular item. So is there a Mr. motion Chair. to approve? Yes, sir. Motion to approve, to approve. Mr. Acting Chair. Uh, Mr. Harrison, and then seconded, Mr. Gordon. Okay. But we, I'm sorry, we need clarification. Is that a motion to approve all, approve with the exception of 30 for, Lafayette? Yes. With the exception of Thank 30 you. Lafayette, yes. Okay, uh, any questions about the others? Or any concerns? Okay, if not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Please raise your hand and say aye. I should ask, uh, is anybody opposed to the committee's recommendations on the others? All right. Uh, I see Santia's hand up. Santia, is that in opposition? Sorry, no, it's not. It's in support. Okay. Okay. Anyone any opposed? any opposition and any abstentions? Okay. All right. So that passes. Uh, so the next one, uh, I just need a motion and a second for the thirty Lafayette. Motion. We're going to motion. All right, Ms. Ms. Ali and then uh, Mr. Harrison. And um, now the, uh, it's on the floor. So is there any questions, concerns? Yeah. Ms. Thompson Manning, you had one? Oh, you, you're you muted. You're on mute. Um, uh. Yeah, yeah, no, we can hear you now. Let Barbara go first. Okay. I, I, I am someone who does not like any kind of eating or drinking in movie theaters. And I'm a little concerned about, mainly because of the noise. And um, I'm concerned about people drinking in a movie theater. I, maybe you can give me, a, Ellen, you can elaborate a little bit more on how this works. And is every movie theater now going to be like this? Mr. Yeah, Chair, I'm happy. Mr. S wait, wait, one second, Mr. Smith is going to respond. Oh, okay. sure. Well, I, there, there's only so much I can say because there, there wasn't anyone at the meeting who expressed any sort of similar concern. Um, the, 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 the concept is that that folks would be um, eating and drinking at the at the movie theater while the the movie is going on, and I can understand and, and sympathize for those who feel concerned about it. I would note that the, across the street, there is the, uh, that, that movie theater at the city point where I believe they allow the same thing. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I don't have much more information to give you than that. Well, I've never oh. been to Alamo and I love BAM and uh, I, I, Okay. But could we hear is, from, uh, from the when, representative when, when, when from BAM? Well, when, yeah, well one before then. Harrison, wait a minute, hold on. Wait, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, hold on, stop, I'm sorry. Let's I'm sorry. get some order Mr. here. Jordan, okay. Mr. Jordan, yeah, I, yes. know, I know you're running the meeting, but people, yeah. let's not do this, right? So the one person at a time, and Mr. Jordan will direct those questions, and let's put this in context. Personal preference is a lot different than what the law allows. Back to you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Okay, Ms. Thompson Manning. Yes, I just wanted to have a, learn a little bit about the law, how it works. 
um, concerning um, drinking at uh, the theater. I just wanted to have a little bit more information about it, if possible. Okay, uh, I think uh, obviously this went to the, do you have any other uh, information on that, Mr. Smith? Or? I really don't have anything more than what I've provided. The, the, yeah. the hours when this is going to be operating is 3.30 p.m. to 12 a.m. And there were 29 signatures of support. Um, and that's the, the pretty much the, the notes that I have from that presentation. And, and the application was already made to the authority, correct? Um, I, Ms. Muller, do you, do you happen to know the answer to that question? The, the way that the process works is that the applicants have to submit their application, their notice first to the community board, and they have to wait 30 days from the date of that mailing before they can apply, before they can submit their application. Um, the SLA is currently taking, I think, 22 to 26 weeks to process. So the community board is typically the first step in the approval. Um, Ellen, have, do you know if you've actually submitted your paperwork yet? Uh, we haven't. We're in process of gathering. It's it's a pretty extensive um, application, so we're we're working. I'm working on that this week, and I, I hope to do it by the end of the week. I, so. I can just comment that there has been nothing um, atypical or unusual about this application. It just happens to be our first one for a movie theater in this district. But a reminder that the law was passed in mid January. So I just have a okay. question, which we well, asked. One second, uh, uh, Ms. Zellegringer. Uh, Mr. Harrison had his hand up before. Sorry. Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison, you're, you're muted. Mute. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. Sorry about that, folks. So I just want to reiterate something which um, uh, Mr. Smith has already said, that in fact, um, I understand and will not dispute what uh, our, our board office has just said. However, it is my recollection, and I think Ms. Thurston can chime in on this if she wishes to, that um, there is this establishment, I guess the name of it is Alamo. I, I do believe Mr. Smith is right. It is in City Point. We went through this a couple of years ago. At the time, I thought it was somewhat unusual. We were told at the time, and correct me if I'm misstating the facts, um, Jessica or Brandon, we were told at the time, that this is kind of the way some movie theaters were going to go. So, uh, and, and in so stating, I want to reiterate what the chair said, which is we can talk about personal preference and we can talk about the law. So in response to some members who may not like eating or drinking, I hear you because I'm not sure I would, but it's not about what I think, what I'd like. We have food at many theaters. And if one does not want to go to a theater that is serving alcohol, one does not have to, one can go to another theater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Harrison. Any other board members have any other questions or concerns? I, I think Ms. Einhorn has had her hand up for some time. Okay, I can't see everybody, I'm sorry. I, uh, Ms. Einhorn. Thank you, sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt. I did wanna mention this license is new and it's beer and wine only. Um, Alamo is different, it does have a, a full liquor license. Um, I, I think that this has been something that has been proposed in New York State for years, and it's only been passed because of how hard hit the movie industry was following COVID. And so I think in support of BAM, it's really important to think about how much income this could generate for them as a business um, and really support them following what has been a, a couple of really, I would imagine, lean years. Thank you, Ms. Einhorn. Um, Ms. Ella Granger, you had another comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, I know at other times we've asked um, what provisions there are to uh, limit the, the service of um, alcohol, if there's you know, some limitation on the number of drinks one could buy or what kind of efforts there would be if someone got out of hand drinking. And I was just wondering, did the committee discuss that at all as they've done in the past? Um, no. Okay. All right. We do have a representative from BAM here, which, which I will allow to give some background information on it. All right. For a minute or two. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Ms. Um, Ms. Lezinski. 
Yes, is that correct? correct? Okay. That is correct, yeah. Uh, I'm happy to provide a little bit more background. Um, first, uh, this, this is a new provision. Uh, unlike Alamo and Nighthawk, if you've been to any movie theaters that serve alcohol, it's not going to be a full restaurant experience. You would buy your drink at concession and bring it in so there's no waiters coming in and out during the film, which is the experience that you would have at Alamo or Nighthawk. Um, as um, Ms. Einhorn said, this is you know much needed revenue stream. It, it puts us, uh, we're able to compete basically with Alamo and Nighthawk, um, which are our, our top sort of competitors in the neighborhood. Um, this has been something that a lot of constituents who have come to BAMP have expressed interest in. Uh, we hold liquor licenses for our regular theaters, for our opera house and for our Harvey theater. And you can have a glass of wine uh, during those shows. So we already have, uh, you know, safety measures and policies in place regarding uh, how we would actually serve patrons who, who come and that, that hasn't been an issue in the past at any of our other venues. So this is just before our cinemas um, and it would be, you know, uh, uh, just as was stated, a, a huge source, potentially a huge source of revenue that we're, we would be very eager to, to have after uh, this pandemic and shutdown. Um, if anyone else has any other specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Oh. Well, that, uh, thank you so much, Ms. Lazinski, for the background information. And that's why I allowed that, because usually all the work is done in committee, and the committee uh, had already voted on this. So I just wanted you to provide some background since we didn't have, uh, it, people were unclear about it. Uh, are there any more comments or uh, concerns from any board members? Well, okay. All right, Ms. Ellegrenga. I was just wondering, you know, what if any plans there are for people? You know, who may have too many drinks. All right. Well, um, I, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I think that's one of the things that would be handled in committee. All right. Uh, and uh, not going to, we're not going to have a question and answer again. Okay. So okay. Um, if there are no more comments, uh, I think we're just going to bring it to a vote. Uh, and I'll just ask, I guess, to be easier for all that are opposed to raise their hand. Okay, Ms. Thompson Manning. I can't see everybody. Did, did I miss anybody? Uh, Mr. Jordan, you, okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Th I'll, I'll see to Ms. Thurston's opinion, but this might be a good oh, moment Thurston, for a roll call. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that, that's totally fine. I was gonna just ask, Ms. Ali had her hand up, but you have kindly lowered it. I did, that? I did, but he started to vote, so I took it down. Okay, so the only opposition I see is Dorothea. It, did, it, did I miss any? Okay. All right, any abstentions? All right, Ms. Zellegrenga, and that's all I could see. Me too. Anyone else, you can shout it. All right, thanks okay. folks. So that passes, thank you. Uh, anything else, Mr. Smith? No. Okay, thank you so much for your report. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, Mr. I do have a question. Mr. Mr. Chairman, my hand is raised for a question to Mr. I'm Smith. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Scott. It's, I can't it's, see it's everybody. On, it's, on a, it's on another. Thank you. Thank you. It's on another issue. Uh, Mr. Smith, our, our economics committee had a, a very intensive and e extensive um, presentation by um, quite a few people who are uh, discussing the, the new uh, cannabis law that uh, is pr presently being passed. I was wondering if your committee has done any investigation or, or looked into that, um, or uh, in some cases, I'm sure our chairman may be discussing it with you separately, or he may be going to discuss it this evening. Have you looked into what the situation actually, is? Because I understand- Actually, Cyril, I was gonna do that, but thank you. Okay, <laughs> then we'll leave, it, we'll leave it at that, Mr. Fanoi, but I just wanted to make sure that Mr. Smith was aware of it. I was going to tell him. Okay. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Jordan? Who I, who I see, yes, I Mr. see Jordan? we have uh, one of our elected officials here. Is yes. that what you're going to tell me? I, I, was, I, saw I was going to ask for, for uh, the floor for Ms. Simon and then also. Yes, for yes. Uh, most certainly. Thank uh, and our assembly person, Ms. Joanne Simon, uh, you had the floor. You're, you're muted, Joanne. Yes, okay. exactly. I was. Uh, <laughs> Just oh, okay. looking for the mute button. So thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate your giving me this opportunity to speak with you uh, a little earlier in, in, in the program tonight. 
uh, because uh, as I, I said, I have uh, two community board meetings. Um, and so uh, I, uh, I did want to just uh, bring everybody uh, my greetings um, and to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing. Uh, as you, you may know, we passed a budget. So that's sort of the first thing uh, that I wanted to talk about. Um, but I also obviously wanted to first, uh, before I talk about uh, uh, the budget, uh, I really just say thank you to all of the first responders and the MTA workers and the average New Yorkers who helped their neighbors uh, uh, yesterday during the, the, the mass shooting, is what, which is what it was, um, uh, on the 36th Street uh, uh, station um, in, uh, in Sunset Park. And uh, as you probably know, they, did have, they have apprehended the suspect and... Um, we are, uh, I think everybody is uh, breathing a sigh of relief, but it's a really important issue. Um, I think that we will be uh, experiencing a great deal of, of, of concern and trauma, certainly for a lot of people uh, going forward. But I did want to, uh, you know, just say a few words about that. Certainly, I think that there are a lot of issues with regard to, uh, to gun violence that we could talk uh, about at greater, at greater length. But I did want to, you know, just acknowledge that and to thank everybody um, you know, the, our fellow New Yorkers who were, were there for others. Um, and, and also uh, uh, just mentioned that um, uh, if you haven't heard, we have our Lieutenant Governor has resigned uh, and um, I think it was the right uh, decision to make. And we are going to figure out what to do next on that. So um, uh, I just wanted to just give some, uh, some time to that. Um, I, I do want to talk about the budget. This was a budget that we started off uh, in, in a, a really good place. Um, and while there was a lot of consternation, I would say towards the, the end when there were a number of policy issues that were inserted into the budget um, at the you know, last two weeks or so um, that gave many of us some pause. Um, it is still, you know, in many, many, many ways, a really excellent budget. We really have record funding for schools and for the environment. Uh, we did we get everything we wanted for the environment? No, but there's a really a lot of money there. Uh, we have really expanded funding for childcare, so we're moving towards universal childcare. We didn't get it all done this time, but those kinds of big issues are ones that you have to move towards. You know, you make progress towards them. Um, we've made a lot of progress towards fully funding SUNY and CUNY. Uh, there's record amount of money uh, to um, higher education. And one of the things that the governor proposed in her budget that we um, accepted, of course, into the final budget was the fact that uh, funding TAP, closing the TAP gap, as you know, there's been a difference between what we provided and what tuition was. Uh, we also are providing TAP for part-time students, which have been neglected in New York for decades. Um, and we are also instituting, reinstituting something that had been abandoned for, for, for a few decades, and that is um, uh, providing TAP for people who are incarcerated uh, so that we can help people uh, get a higher education and move on with their lives after they re-enter um, society. So I'm very happy that we were able to do that. We accelerated middle-class tax cuts, uh, provided a lot of uh, uh, funding through tax cuts, uh, through tax credits uh, for childcare. Um, and we are also provided uh, a great deal of money to help with utility arrears. We put in uh, over a billion dollars for um, rental assistance in the ERAP program and for landlords, for example, who are unable to pay their bills because of, of not having rent. Um, and, and we don't want them to be defaulting on their mortgages either. And so uh, we have mon money in there for the LRAP program. And then just, you know, sort of parent, uh, uh, to put a highlight on some of the conversation you just had, uh, we did pass drinks to go. Uh, everybody in New York and certainly everybody in my district was dying to have drinks to go. It did make a huge difference to keep a lot of our bars and restaurants open uh, during the pandemic. And everybody seems very excited about that. I personally don't drink, so I don't really care myself, but it does make a difference to our bars and restaurants. Um, and uh, so we were very happy we were able to do that. We have expanded health care coverage. Uh, there will be um, property tax relief checks um, and, and some other things we did that I wasn't crazy about, including the fact that uh, our child care didn't cover immigrant families. And we 
do have that new uh, stadium in uh, Buffalo that is a very expensive stadium. The way stadiums are funded throughout the country is really, in, in my mind, uh, disgraceful. Uh, but that did pass in the budget. And um, uh, there were a couple of other things on the criminal justice front that I didn't support as well, uh, including some changes to Kendra's law, which is uh, 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 probably more detailed than you wanted to know. But I wanted to give you a little update about that. Uh, we'll be sending out more information about uh, details in the budget, but I'm happy to answer any questions that people have, uh, either with regard to the budget or anything else. Thank you. Mr. Scala's hand is raised and Ms. Zoller Gringer's hand. Okay, Mr. Scala. Mr. Scala. You're muted. You're muted. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Simon. Uh, you, thank you for coming and um, I'm so happy you always come and speak to us. It's a, it's a pleasure having you give us an update. Um, I have two questions. One, a crystal ball question. Do you think that CUNY would ever go back to being free of tuition and also in the budget, has there been any um, uh, plan to expand economic development, especially in uh, some of the boroughs of New York, especially Brooklyn and areas where we have some undeveloped areas where we could build some economic development for the people who live around those areas? Thank well, you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, yes, there has been a lot of, I don't know whether we'll get there, uh, we weren't able to get there this year, but we have a big uh, proposal called the New Deal for CUNY, right? And that one of the goals of the New Deal for CUNY is not just to uh, bring in more faculty, for example, to provide uh, support for students in a variety of ways. You know, often tuition is one issue, but for many of our students, it's housing, it's food insecurity, uh, it's healthcare. So um, uh, providing additional assistance to help with mental health. You know, a lot of our students really experienced a great deal of difficulty uh, and trauma during COVID as, as well. And so that's a big need on our campuses, but we are trying to move to a free uh, CUNY system. Um, uh, there's a lot of support in the legislature for that. Um, I think it will take a little bit longer uh, to achieve that, but um, you know, Andrew Gennardis is the uh, the lead sponsor in the in the Senate on the New Deal for CUNY. I am a sponsor of uh, the bill in in the Assembly. I'm a, a co-sponsor of that bill, and many of us have been working very hard towards that. So I'm very hopeful that it will happen at some point. Um, I don't know that it, it certainly didn't happen this year. I don't know that it'll happen next year, but we really are moving uh, in that direction. And then the other issue with economic development, there is certainly additional money towards economic development. There's been money towards um, uh, some of the uh, environmental, um, uh, you know, brownfields, for example, which is really a green economic development program in, in, in many respects. Um, uh, what happens with a lot of economic development money is that it is also kind of given to the city and the city then uh, uses it. So it's not, it's not necessarily that we pick out an area, we don't do direct land use. Uh, from the state level, with the exception of certain projects, for example, like, you know, Atlantic Yards was a state program, um, but that happens less frequently. For example, most of the land use planning uh, is really through the city. Okay, any other questions for Assembly Member, Mr. Zellegringa? Well, I, I was actually trying to applaud, but uh, since uh, I just thank you so much, Joanne, for that update. I was wondering, you were talking about ERAP funds. Are those new additional funds so that people yes. who applied and, and didn't get funding will now yes. have that opportunity? That's wonderful. Yeah, that was a real problem because we, we gave several, you know, hundred million dollars uh, to ERAP uh, last year, but we ran out of money. Right. Uh, the first problem was, of course, and this was not an uncommon for the uh, former administration, we, you know, appropriated the money, but then it took a really long time getting out the door. The department of budget wasn't, you know, writing those checks kind of thing. Um, and so one of the things Governor Hochul did when she came in was to really get that money out. Uh, but because there was such great need, um, we ran out of money. So now we have put just an ERAP alone, $900 million. Terrific, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And then is there anybody else that I missed that I can't see, let's say? Mr. Harrison's hand is up. Okay, Mr. Harrison. Um, uh, Mr. Flynn, Okay. Mr. Harrison, unmute yourself, please. You're muted, Mr. Harrison. 
Mr. Harrison, you're muted. Sorry about that again. I had unmuted, but apparently it got remuted by the by the by the protocol of the meeting. Joanne, I just wanted to say uh, also thank you so much. Um, what I it's always a pleasure to see you. You always come with great information, and you always support great causes in your role in the assembly. One of the things that I find most impressive, besides the way you present your causes and the ones you champion is the fact that they are very important in community board too, but they are also very important throughout the borough and throughout the state. And so with that, I wanna say something, I mean no offense to anyone who's gonna hear me say this, but I just wanted to say this. If the situation were to present itself and someone was to ask you um, for your interest or your um, participation as Lieutenant Governor, I think it would be an honor to have you as Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Harris. I find it very, very unlikely that that will be the case, but thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris and Mr. Flanoy. Yes, hi, thank you very much. Uh, Assemblywoman Ms. Simon, I was kind of curious about what the situation is right now with evictions, now that the uh, moratorium is over. I noticed that right now individuals were looking for help. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the lawyers are overwhelmed in most cases and are not available to actually help out individuals who are trying to prevent themselves from being evicted. Is there anything that's going on that we can actually help these individuals, especially the seniors who are very much in desperate need of help? Well, you know, it's a good question and very timely. Um, earlier today, I was out at a rally. Um, at Housing Court in Manhattan, uh, calling on the Office of Court Administration to um, uh, slow down the role of uh, these eviction cases. So what it seems to be what's happening is that the courts are kind of pushing the cases through. And if somebody doesn't have counsel assigned to them, because they have in New York City a right to counsel in, in uh, uh, landlord-tenant matters, then they're just going ahead and processing the case and leaving the person to fend for themselves unrepresented. And the whole purpose of having a right to counsel is that you have access to counsel. Uh, but those um, public interest law firms that are there to represent people in these cases are overwhelmed with the numbers because there are a huge number of people. You know, the ERAP program doesn't force a landlord to participate. You know, the state will pay their back uh, rent but they can't just take the money and then kick somebody out. So there's a whole slew of, of landlords who are refusing to participate in the ERAP program and just wanting to evict. And the problem for that for us is of course, is that where uh, these evictions take place is that um, it's not saving anybody any money. Uh, it's not helping these people who are tenants and is putting pe jeopardizing people and putting them at risk of homelessness, which is always going to cost all of us a lot more money and uh, for uh, the people who are involved a lot more trauma and is totally unnecessary in many cases. A lot of times things can work out. So in our office, we've been getting a lot of requests uh, for this and we normally we send people to Brooklyn Legal Services or another um, uh, public interest firm that can represent tenants, but we're finding that they're just not able to take on any more business. Uh, so one of the, the, the groups that has been effective, and if you have the opportunity to share this with people, please do, is the New York Peace Institute, which is located here in downtown Brooklyn, and they do a lot of mediation and they will also, number one, help explain people what their rights are. So that's very important because so many people are just frightened and don't know. And many, of course, people are not, uh, not uh, native speakers of English. And a lot of the stuff is very complicated uh, in any language. And so the Peace Institute can help with that. But also, they can also try and help work something out with the landlord. If there's a way they can resolve the issue through mediation, for example, uh, without having to engage in litigation, uh, they have a good relationship with the courts as well. They have been able to help many people. And I saw somebody from the Peace Institute the other night at something, and she said that she was getting, a, there were a lot of calls coming in and they were very happy uh, that we were referring people to them. So uh, that is another option for people. 
uh, that I uh, encourage people to, to uh, see if that will be uh, a way for them to, to get their needs resolved. Uh, but we are really asking the Office of Court Administration to chill out a little bit here um, and, and uh, uh, help people get the representation they need. Because as you know, justice delayed is justice denied. Doesn't matter if you have a right to counsel, if you can't get an attorney, uh, you, there's, no, there's nobody left. The, you, know, the, uh, uh, you know, the attorneys are, are completely overwhelmed with the caseload. So it's a real capacity issue. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Simon, and it's always good to see you. Um, and thanks everybody for the questions. And uh, we're gonna, we have a few other elected officials. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, please. Yeah. Thank you so much, Councilmember Crystal. Hudson, my apologies, uh, and then Councilmember Res Ressler right after her. Not a problem. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you to the Assembly Member for that very uh, thorough and comprehensive update. Um, I agree with her sentiments around the stadium and as somebody who uh, worked in, in sports before getting into public service, um, I could tell you they've got plenty of money to pay for their own stadium. So um, I'll, leave, I'll leave it at that. I wanted to address, before I get into my formal announcements, I did want to address um, you know, the gun violence issue uh, that's been occurring um, in the community. My team is working on, and, and they'll be reaching out um, very soon, but we're working on, a, on a creating a community safety council. Um, it's something that we've done already on the Crown Heights side of the district after um, some gun uh, incidents over there. Um, and so we'll be doing the same thing on this side of the district. And it's essentially just bringing in um, some stakeholders to, to have regular conversations about how we can help you know, stem the violence um, and these, these incidents that are occurring and to also provide um, you know, something close to what would be like a rapid response immediately following um, these inc incidents. So we'll be following up and, and reaching out about that. Um, and forgive me, uh, Andrew, my team had to jump off. So I'm, I'm flying solo. So I'm gonna do my best to drop the links in as I, uh, as I give these updates, but I wanted to make mention that if you haven't already uh, completed the Willoughby Avenue Open Streets DOT survey, um, that is closing on Friday, and I'm gonna drop the link right now, Friday, April 15th. Um, so if you haven't done that yet, you can do that here. Um, DOT, we actually, um, uh, asked DOT to go out in person. They were out there, uh, I think the first weekend in April, I think last week, uh, I guess it's two weeks ago now. Um, we, they were originally gonna do just the digital plan um, and we asked them to make sure they were out there in person. I think they were out there for two days um, and some folks from my team joined them as well um, to ensure that uh, everybody had the opportunity to fill out um, the survey. We had also, um, done some flyering in advance and made sure we, you know, spread the information far and wide so people can come out and take the survey. So this has been administered not solely um, online or digitally. Um, last week, we, uh, the city council held a hearing almost six hours for uh, joint committees on Committee on Fire and Emergency Management and the Committee on Housing and Buildings and the Twin Park Citywide Task Force on Fire Prevention um, to address the Bronx fire that happened earlier this year that tragically you know, caused 17 folks to, to lose their lives. Um, I introduced a piece of legislation that's aimed at you know, preventing um, further fires like this from occurring. Um, it's just one, one step in, in doing that. It's certainly not a solution. Um, but in raising the minimum heat temperatures in the evening. What we heard from not just the, the victims and families um, at Twin Parks, but from other constituents as well, people are using their ovens and space heaters to keep warm at night, um, which is just obviously very dangerous. And so any little thing we can do to help ensure uh, people don't have to resort to those um, tactics is, you know, I think a step in the right, a right direction. Um, if anyone is looking for assistance with their taxes, uh, we have a partnership with Grow Brooklyn who's offering free tax help 
uh, leading up to um, and past the filing deadline. And I'll drop that link in just a second. You can um, make an appointment with them. Um, and for those of you who may not know, we uh, do a series called Coffee with Crystal. We go to a different coffee spot around the district. It is very informal. It's an opportunity for people to just come and have conversations about whatever is on their mind. It's a great opportunity to build community, meet your neighbors. Um, we will be holding one on April 23rd, which is a Saturday at um, a coffee shop on the corner of Grand and Clifton called Guevara's. Um, it is a trans owned vegan, um, you know, cafe, um, but you know, they still have like the regular coffees and teas and lattes and anything you all may want. We provide um, all the, the beverages and, and pastries. So I invite everyone um, to come through there and I will also drop the registration link for that in just a moment. Um, and I also wanted to just mention and, and commend you all for having the fellow on that you had earlier today. Um, that was a great presentation and also community board, you know, leads on so many issues and you all are always doing amazing things. Um, and, and so I just wanted to commend you and say, I thought that was great. And uh, I hope that other community boards will, will follow suit. Um, and I think that's it for me. So I'll drop in a couple of links. You can always find us. I'll drop our contact information as well. Um, but thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Council Member. Do you have time for a question or two? I do. I do. Okay. Uh, any questions for the Council Member? Okay. I, I don't see everybody. So is there anything I'm missing? I guess. I have a question. I have a question, Leonard. It's Suzanne. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, have, I have a question. I don't know if you have the answer, uh, Council, uh, Council Member Hudson. Yeah, I bet but not. Um, with regards to the fire safety, I live in a condo and we don't have um, a speaker system, you know, in the hallways, um, you know, nor do, um, as I understand with that fire in the Bronx, the doors are supposed to shut automatically, uh, right, right to, keep, to contain the fire, you know, in my condo, that's not the case either. Um, I assume because these aren't the laws for, um, for residences of my nature, it's, I live in a large building. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you know, um, sort of what the requirements are for, you know, uh, for condos and co-ops, et cetera, uh, rental buildings on fire safety. Yeah, I, I don't believe there are exceptions to that law. Um, I don't believe there's a carve out for co-ops and condos. We uh -huh. can definitely follow up. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to misspeak. We'll have to, you know, look into it um, and get you. Yeah, uh, it's okay. Like, yeah, I'll follow up. Nice answer, but, but my, and, and um, I know Council Member Ressler is going to speak right after me. So if, if he has any insight, um, you know, he can provide that as well. But I don't believe there are any exceptions. And so actually what we've been doing is, you know, asking people to let us know if, if that isn't the case. Um, so we can connect offline and um, you know, we'd be happy to, you know, try to connect you to the Department of Buildings um, or the Fire Department to maybe do an assessment and to see how they might be able to assist with um, getting some of those regulations um, met. Uh, we did um, we did a tour a couple of months ago with um, Senator uh, Zelnor Myrie and Assemblymember uh, Ferris Souffrant. Um, you know, basically for that that very reason, we went into buildings that we had heard directly from constituents that they didn't have the self closing doors and and things like that. So happy to chat um, okay. offline. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and thanks for raising that. It's definitely yeah, obviously fun. raise the raise the consciousness for all of us yeah. in our living situations. Absolutely. Hey, thank you so much. Okay, I have, uh, I have a very minor question uh, to, okay. uh, the to Councilman way. Hudson. Yeah. <clears throat> This is absolutely so small of an issue compared to the fire issues, but I, I support you and what you're trying to do for the community, for people to talk out, out either one way or the other way on the open streets. But I have a little thing that I know I've, I've pestered you about. Uh, some signage is definitely necessary. The car hails do not enter the streets like they're supposed to because they are afraid of fines, points, et cetera anything that could be put up as signs so that uh, Uber riders, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, taxi cabs 
know that they could go into Willoughby Avenue without getting fined. Okay, yes, noted. Thank you. Thank you. And, okay. and you know, just so folks know, and again, I'll drop my contact information and some other links in just a moment, but, you know, you should always feel free to give us a call or, or send us an email with any thoughts you have um, on anything, of course, but specifically uh, the Willoughby Avenue Open Street, because this is the opportunity for us to make amendments and changes as the community wishes. Thank you so much, Council Member Hudson. Ms. And Einhorn's hand is raised. Excuse me? Ms. Einhorn's hand is raised. Okay, I couldn't see her at all. Okay, Ms. Einhorn. <laughs> Just one last question. So for the Bronx fire um, and full disclosure, I, I was part of that response with the city, but I, I'm curious because my understanding is that the actual cause was the, the heater, um, the electrical heater that had been left running for days. And yeah. there were many, many complaints about this building, about the, the heat. Um, and I, I know that this is an issue that comes up in a lot of housing. There were three different types of vouchers that were being used and the majority of residents were here because the building accepted vouchers. Um, and I'm concerned that this is a trend, that we continue to have fires in the Bronx every year um, and that they're mostly related to, to issues of heat um, and lack of heat and things that people do to try to get heat. Exactly. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we wouldn't see, I, I went to the funeral actually and I have um, uh, a, a, a good friend of mine whose family was impacted, who grew up in the building. And um, so I was hearing from, from her and, and other families, even though obviously it's very far from my district, um, but I was hearing from folks regularly. And, you know, they made it very clear if this had happened just two or three zip codes south of, of where they were, um, well, it wouldn't have happened, frankly. It wouldn't have happened a few zip codes away. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, an issue of, uh, of poverty. It's an issue of, um, you know, predatory landlords, um, you know, who knowingly uh, are neglectful and it's not just heat, you know, in so many of these buildings, it's repairs, it's, you know, maintenance, it's um, extermination services, like it's all of these things that landlords refuse to provide um, when you know the rest of us get those services and don't have to beg and plead for those services. They they pay rent every month just like everybody else, you know. Um, and you know we know that if it wasn't a, a predominantly black immigrant community, it wouldn't have happened. And so I think you know the council is taking this very seriously. The committee that I mentioned, the task force. Um, which is the Twin Park Citywide Task Force on Fire Prevention, was created immediately after um, this by the speaker specifically to address this fire and also to ensure that these types of fires do not happen in other, you know, similar communities anywhere, obviously, but, you know, um, they're most likely to happen in these types of communities where there is, you know, great negligence from, from these landlords. And so it's something that the city council is taking seriously um, it's things that we're talking about in our budget negotiations, you know, how to support these types of communities. I heard all sorts of things, you know, even when it comes to, and you said you were part of the uh, response to this, but, you know, just cultural competence um, in providing services and resources to immigrant communities that don't speak English as their first language. These are all, you know, intersectional issues, um, and they're issues that impact uh, the most uh, vulnerable and marginalized among us. Um, and so, you know, every, everything, you know, that I do and, and, and that my office prioritizes is always trying to think about, you know, how do we make things better and how do we provide more access for the people who need it the most? Um, so I appreciate your comments and, and thank you. Um, you know, I think council member Ressler would agree and he's co-chair of the Progressive Caucus um, but if, if, not, if not the entire council, although I'm, I'm sure the entire council is prioritizing these types of issues, but if not, certainly the Progressive Caucus is prioritizing these issues. And um, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know we're in the 30s out of 51 members. And so that's a, a big majority um, of people who are prioritizing the needs of these communities. 
Thank you so much, Councilmember Hudson. Uh, yep. Thank you for being here and thank you for answering the questions. Uh, and uh, we're going to move on to Council Member Lincoln Ressler. Is he here? I'm here. Okay. Chris and Jordan, thank you for having me. It's great to be back home at CB2. Uh, Joanne Simon and Crystal Hudson are tough acts to follow. So I will try to be uh, brief and, uh, and not nearly as uh, erudite or entertaining. But, um, but firstly, I just want to say uh, yesterday was one of the scariest that we've had in Brooklyn in many years. And, you know, my heart is with the Sunset Park community and everybody who's been impacted and um, just, you know, relieved that we've, you know, apprehended the gentleman who was responsible and that we managed to, to avert fatalities in this, um, in this just horrifying experience. So um, just, you know, everybody hold your loved ones a little tighter tonight. Um, you know, is is it just a terribly scary day? Um, and I want to also just it's a um, it's great that we have both Pesach, Passover, and Easter coming the same weekend. I want to wish everybody a very happy holiday and hope everyone enjoys it. Um, and I wanted to also share that we've been going through uh, the community board appointment process. We've made we got terrific applications to CB two. We went through. Uh, each and every one of them in a detailed fashion. And I'm really excited about some of the new folks who we've recommended to the borough president to join uh, community board too. Lenny gave us some guidance on some of the, the gaps that he saw on the board and ways in which we could try to appoint folks to be helpful. And I think that we've done that. And uh, we've been in touch with uh, the borough president and his team and, and they're, they're making progress on their final appointments as well. So we're really excited about um, uh, continuing to, to have great people be a part of CB2. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your service. Um, I also wanted to thank all of the folks who made it out to our community assembly and inauguration just about a week ago. We had, I don't know, 250 plus neighbors come out and join great breakout sessions um, on transportation issues and housing issues and climate issues and sanitation issues. And we've we've got action items and action steps and organizing um, initiatives uh, in each of those areas happening around the district. Um, so we're, we're trying to sign a thousand new people up to compost in, in District 33. We've got community cleanups happening in every neighborhood. Really want to encourage each and every one of you to sign up and join some of our organizing efforts to make our neighborhoods even better. Uh, wanted to, to provide a couple uh, local updates. One is about the shelters that, have, that are planned on the, the 33rd side. Both have, have been delayed according to the latest updates we got from the Department of Homeless Services. Uh, the last we heard, uh, which is a couple weeks ago now, um, one Hoyt is slated for a June opening um, and 316 Atlantic uh, is slated for an August opening. I wouldn't uh, uh, have all that much faith in either of those timelines, considering they both seem to slip every time we ask, but wanted to just share the information that we've been receiving. The good news is that uh, both of those sites, we've been able to set up job fairs at local public housing developments to ensure that the people who are working in the shelters are actually, they live in our community and especially come from public housing developments in our community. We've also been working with the, the stakeholders at One Hoyt on developing their security plan. We've got recommendations into DHS for community advisory board that's gonna meet and be in place prior to the shelter opening. And we're very eager to partner with CB2 um, and other local stakeholders as it relates to 316 Atlantic um, would love to, you know, replicate what I think has been a good process at One Hoyt and, and ensure that we have real community engagement and have a chance for people to have their questions answered and their concerns addressed um, uh, with the shelter operator, which is Black Vets for Social Justice. It's a really good organization that's been based in bed since before I was born, um, and they do good work, and I, I really i am hopeful they'll be a good partner to us on Atlantic. A uh, couple other quick issues. We had a, a great community forum uh, just over a week ago about the jail dismantling, uh, which is moving forward. Uh, and so that's going to be taking place over the next couple months. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns around what's happening there, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, we've also, uh, we've been working closely with the Department of Design and Construction and their contractors to make sure that we're mitigating traffic as well as we can, uh, that we are addressing any public health concerns around the demolition, um, and that we're trying to, to limit noise and impacts as much as possible. Uh, but please let me know if there are any issues and if we can help in any way, we, we are here for it. Um, another big issue that we're, we're focused on tackling is 
uh, alternate side parking uh, or lack of compliance with alternate side parking, uh, particularly in the Boreham Hill section of CB2. Uh, this weekend, we were flyering along State Street, Pacific Street, Bergen Street, Dean Street, um, letting drivers know that we were pushing to, to do more aggressive enforcement with the to address the lack of ASP compliance. Uh, we, we had extra teams out from the NYPD traffic on Monday and Tuesday, and we were ticketing, you know, they were ticketing pretty aggressively. Uh, we're also looking at legislative solutions because I think part of what's happened is with the reduction of ASP to one side a week, that $65 ticket is just the cost of doing business for too many drivers. And they think that it's cheaper to keep their car parked on the street than it is to park it in a garage and they don't move it. And, uh, and it's not okay. Uh, the street conditions have been getting worse and worse. And we're going to do our best to try and make sure that drivers are complying with alternate side parking. I don't want to see us return to twice a week ASP. Uh, instead, the approach that we're, we're trying to take legislatively is to see cumulative tickets increase the amount of the fines. So if somebody's a repeat offender at three or four times in a month, that they would face higher fines than what they're currently paying of just the same $65 ticket. Uh, two other quick issues uh, to highlight and then happy to take any questions if folks have them. One is that we've been doing a lot of work in Dumbo. Uh, 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 we've got a task force that we're restarting uh, tomorrow with DDC, uh, DOT, DOB, um, DAC, uh, the Dumbo Action Committee, and the Dumbo Bid uh, to, to make sure we're all working together on the Dumbo Street Reconstruction Project that's happening throughout the neighborhood. We've got about just about two years to go. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolutely essential project to expand the sewer infrastructure in Dumbo, to expand the um, uh, to address flooding conditions in Dumbo. We, we're adding 82 cash basins, which will be incredibly helpful, but we need to all work together to get it done fast and get it done right. And so our office is taking the lead to make sure that everybody's coordinated to make that happen. And I also wanted to let you know, we've been in active touch with the MTA around York Street, and they are very sensitive about to coming back to CB2 as quickly as they can. I made it clear to them that before this year is out, you know, before we hit June, they need to be back here with a presentation with concrete updates. And I want you to know that along with Joanne Simon, um, uh, we are pushing and pushing hard uh, to come up with some solutions at York Street. And I want to thank all the, the members of the Dumbo community uh, for their advocacy. Um, there's a whole lot more going on, but I don't, I don't want to talk at you for too long. I just want you to know that any problem, big or small, we are a phone call away. Arvind Sinwani uh, was gracious enough to put his email in the chat and our office email in the chat. He is our uh, community advocate for, for CB2 and he's terrific. Um, you're better off talking to him than me. Um, but um, if there's any questions that I can answer or any issues that we can help on, please don't hesitate to let us know. Thank you, council member. All right, so any questions for the council member? Mr. Gordon's hand is raised. I'm yeah. sorry, Mr. Gordon. Finally, can call from Hi, Lincoln, yeah. Carlton Gordon. Good to see you, Carlton. How uh, are you? All right, good to see you, Lincoln. Okay. Um, one thing that came up, I know you were, and I can understand your position on the when new developments, new buildings are coming up, you were concerned about parking requirements. Uh, now, for those who are in downtown Borham Hill, Brooklyn Heights, uh, a, a parking requirement is can be seen as burdensome. And I think that was one of the things that you would express what's your position on parking requirements for new buildings. But I'm hearing from people on the, let's say the other side of the park, coming from Fort Greene and Clinton Hill, further east, who are very car dependent. And they've expressed to me that, you know, a great concern that, well, we need our cars to park you know, let's say, uh, you know, near Fulton Street, so we can, you know, pick up some clothes and shopping and whatever. And there's some really some concern about that. So I thought you're kind of, you're kind of caught between those two uh, positions, but I just wanted to express that to say that I understood that, yes, more parking is not necessarily wanted if you're in downtown, but if you're coming from Clinton Hill, they want the parking for their car. Totally. No, look, Carlton, I really appreciate you raising the raising the point. It's a it's a tricky one because, you know, in the downtown Brooklyn area, we've seen a phenomenal increase in the population. Um, and, you know, people, many people have cars. Right. And so how do we accommodate that and how do we think about a new development? But I'll give you a little background on kind of where this policy approach came from. Uh, you know, as a new council member, I, I'm starting to get these ULERP applications and, you know, 
Carlton is that our land use chair, you know these well, uh, that have come across my desk. And, and I had two actually in the community board, one, and one was literally uh, their new development of 70 units on top of a G train stop. Another one was 50 units on top of Bedford and North 7th on top of the L train. And in both of these developments that had already certified um, and they were beginning to go through the Euler process, I was told I have no choice, but I am but to approve parking at this site. It is required. There is no uh, exception. There is nothing I can do. It is a fait accompli that there is going to be parking in these developments. And I said, that doesn't make sense, right? There are times when parking does make sense, but why should it be required in the development uh, without us having the discretion to see, does it make sense here or not? And so what what I proposed and, and was uh, with, with our borough president, uh, uh, Antonio Reynoso, and, and we were fortunate to have, a, a, I think, a dozen or so, nine or 10, uh, at least, Brooklyn Council members, including my good friend in the 35th, Crystal Hudson, uh, signed on to, was to say, we're telling developers, we have a simple message for developers. When you're applying to certify your Euler, you also should file a special permit that eliminates the requirement for the parking. We may still negotiate to have some parking at that site. We may not. It depends on the development, but it shouldn't be required. We should have a conversation about it, and it should be a it should be a part of the application process that we discuss together with the community board and other stakeholders. So that, that we're trying to add flexibility here, and that's the approach we're taking. And I think it makes a lot of sense because, you know, in in some new developments on top of train stations, we don't want to be. Uh, you know, forcing developers to spend enormous sums of money digging underground parking lots or ground floor parking that's taking away from commercial spaces, we want them to be investing in affordable housing, right? That's what I want to see every last, you know, penny of theirs go into. So this approach gives us some additional flexibility to try to make that happen. I hope that gives a little context. Thank you, in Thank you Carlton. Always good to see you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the council member? All right, is there any hands I'm not seeing? Okay. Seeing none, thank you so much, Council Member. Thank Rest. you for having me. I hope thank you all you have also, a great night. Yes. Take and thank care. you also, Council Member Hudson, for joining us and answering the questions and uh, giving us a good presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go back to our uh, to our agenda. I guess all of you have forgotten what our agenda is at this point, huh? Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the next uh, committee to um, actually committee uh, committee actions is land use committee. Mr. Carlton Gordon. Gordon, you're, you're muted, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, I, he's still muted. Ms. Mueller, is it, can he unmute or? The host does not have. Okay, all right, no, I, I knocked myself <laughs> off. All right, thank you. Okay, yeah, well, I was trying to hit the button, I knocked everything off. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. We have three uh, buildings that were uh, all approved for Landmark Preservation Commission applications. Oh, before I forget, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll proceed with them. Uh, 55. Are we doing the 55 uh, prospects? Are you doing, are we board doing, the, doing the Board of Standards one first, right? That's the first one on there? Uh, oh. Yes, 55 prospect. Right. Oh. Okay. Hold on. Okay, I was uh I was informed otherwise. All right. Well, 55 Prospect was a board of standard and appeals application. Uh oh goodness. Yes, the board of standards and appeals application, which was approved uh by our committee 1200. Uh it was for a uh Okay. Yes. 
it would basically allow for a hold on because I because I was informed that, that we were going on something else. Uh, but we we had a hearing on this, and basically it is a um, all right, hold on. Mr. Gordon, would you like me to read the brief for you? Okay, go ahead. Yes, because I was informed that we were going to do the LPCs. Uh, that's why. I, so I was a little surprised to see the uh, the fifty five prospect. Uh, no, but yes, I'm happy go ahead. This. So the scope of the project is it's a special permit for a special use group three school on the ground mm -hmm. floor and cellar of an existing building in an M16 light manufacturing zoning district in Dumbo. It's the interior renovation of 7,000 square feet on the ground floor, 2,000 square feet of the cellar. There are no structural changes to the building. The project will not enlarge the building's envelope nor affect the exterior. And the applicant is an early childhood education provider, which already operates three schools in Manhattan. Right, that was the one way. Yeah, it's a uh, they're sort of like a like a large daycare center on that one uh, in Dumbo, and they uh, would. It's a it seemed to be a moderately priced uh, daycare work that would be done at that location. Uh, I think the uh, community group had no problem with it. Uh, we liked what we saw with it, and we approved that one twelve zero. Yes, yes, twelve zero zero on that one. So we okay. approved that one, and we asked for your approval of the four fifty five Prospect uh, Street. Okay. All you right. Want me so, to do the. Well, okay. let's, do, we, do we have to do a roll call vote on this one? Uh, I might recommend that not, as a BSA and it's going to a different agency. Yes, please. Right. It's like a Euler so, type, but okay. it's not Euler. Let's go ahead and do it, and I'm happy to read them off. Okay, so Mr. one second. Mr. We need a motion. One second. Hold on. We need a motion to yes. accept the committee's. Uh, I move to accept the committee's recommendation, Mr. Chair. And we need a second. Second. Okay, okay Mr. Flanoy. Okay, are there any questions about this? 55 prospect. Any questions or comments from the board? I have a question. It's, it's Suzanne Quint. Yes. Hi. yes. Um, I think the question was, are they participating in the pre-K for all program, which would allow for free, uh, uh, free pre-K? Um, I and then you said it was moderately priced. Um, that's definitely, I guess, uh, in the eyes of the beholder, what moderate is. Um, was, the, uh, was there any detail? Um, there were questions from the community around just in general serving the community um, and affordability. Okay. I'll well, they're trying to, it, yeah, they're trying to make it as an affordable, you know, affordable, but it's still a private, uh, it's a private enterprise that's done by this uh, particular, I think it's called, um, it's a very odd little name on it. Go Vizu. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's a private, it's a privately run business. Uh, so this one is not. I don't know. Maybe they can apply for any kind of uh, subsidies that would uh, make it for free. But this is a privately run business, and it would. They wish, but they still wish to try to be of assistance to people throughout the community. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say it, that may be, have been a little out of the scope of the land use committee, uh, yeah. since they were concerned with the structure and everything else. Uh, Ms. Blunt, Ms. Blount, I'm sorry, you had your hand up? Yes, we um, did talk about um, affordability, and they said, and they said um, that they could okay. have subsidies, like Mr. Goyne said, I'm sorry to repeat it, because I was yeah, wondering about the same thing. Um, they said they had some subsidy for people who um, was having difficulty, but they was no. very vague about, you know, the amount that they would have to pay or, you know, what what criteria that, you know, would that you would need to meet the subsidy. So that was it. Thank you very much, Ms. Blount. Um, any other questions or comments, concerns? Uh, Ms. Uh, Morales. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, did they, is there a specific number in, in an amount when it comes to the fee 
I know you said moderately priced, but did anyone, I, was anyone able to get a number? No, we didn't get numbers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions, uh, Mr. Ms. Feibush? Hi, I have a brief question. Uh, how many children do they say this facility would serve? Um, I'm trying to think. It would sound like it would be in the do at least in the dozens. Uh, because are they going you know, to have like the yellow buses? I mean, that's a very busy area. Are they? Are they anticipating that most of their children will be local? The parents walk them there, or, or the caregivers? That's or, what they anticipate. Yeah, that the people will be coming there. Or they'll be either walk there or take public transit, uh, but they'll be coming. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not at this point, I don't recall that they will be picking up or having a bus, you know, a shuttle bus type mm -hmm. uh, thing. That was not part of what they were looking for. Hey, Mr. Thank Heilen. You. I'm, thank you, Ms. Feibus. Mr. Heilen. Yes, hi, I'm, I'm the attorney for Vivi and I was at the uh, meeting a few weeks ago. It's uh, up to a hundred uh, children. That's the, uh, the amount of children and there won't be uh, school buses, it will be privately uh, dropped off by the parents and uh, caregivers of the children. And we set out- yeah, Thank you, I was trying to remember, it's that odd name, Vivi. Vivi, right, yeah. Vivi. Vivi, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, any other questions or comments? All right. Mr. Scala has a hand raised. Mr. Scala. Mr. Chairman, I, thank you. I, I just want to, uh, you, your, your point may be well taken. Um, are we, what does the landmarks uh, uh, committee, do they take into consideration uh, what these private companies uh, hire and who they don't hire when, they, when they're uh, approving or disapproving the, their application? I think we're talking about something that is probably not in their uh, venue. I'm not sure. I just need clarity. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Gordon. We try to work with, you know, we try to work with see if people can work locally or, you know, people from the community, we will try. But basically uh, what this application really was for is, is this an acceptable use of the space? Uh, we look to see that they're not going to wreck the place, obviously. Uh, but other than that, it's a, uh, is this, a, is this, is this, is this a uh, acceptable use? And can this be, you know, fit in the community? And we felt so. That's why we voted for a 12-0. Okay, any other comments or concerns? Okay, if not, uh, Ms. Thurston, we go to the roll call. Yep, all right, uh, going alphabetically by last name, so be prepared to come off mute, folks. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ali, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Blount? Yes. Ms. Chang? Madison? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ms. Cobb? Yes. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Einhorn. Yes. Ms. Feibush. Yes. Uh, Mr. Flanoy. Yes. Ms. Gilman. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gordon. Yes. Did he say yes? Mr. Harrison. Yes. Mr. Howald. Yes. Ms. C Hubbard coming in weary. Yes. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Lastowecki. Yes. Ms. McKnight. Yes. Ms. Masso. Yes. Ms. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Quint. Yes. Ms. Quint. Yes. Ms. Richardson. Yvette? Uh, Mr. Scala. Mr. Scala? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Staten? Abstain. Okay. Ms. Thompson Manning? Yes. Ms. Thurston, I will also abstain. Ms. Ayler Gringer? Yes. And Mr. Singletary, I'm not sure if he's still on. I don't think he's on. Uh, okay. Um, oh, Ms. Morales, I didn't have you um, 
marked as in attendance. How do you vote? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Anyone Perfect. else I missed? Yes, Miss Oh, Santia. Yes. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Thank you. All right, that passes unanimously. Well, not unanimously, two abstentions. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Thurston. Uh, the next, uh, Mr. Uh, Gordon, recommendations of the Public Design Commission. Right. This is uh, 63 Flushing Avenue. Do we have that yes. one? Yeah. Okay. All right. 63 Flushing Avenue is, in, is really part of the Brooklyn Navy Yard building number 74. Now, on this one, and I do remember it very well. It's the uh, it's a pri again a private company that's building inside, and what they're doing is they expand they they're redoing one of the old build smaller buildings, by which they will be uh, let's say will be energy efficient or hopefully energy efficient. Uh, let's say appliances or work that's going to be done so that. The it'll be parts it, it can that then let's say sell it or accept, it's, it's going to be selling things they'll be selling to be part of energy efficient appliances, but it it was some con, you know the concern of course is that they will be I won't say explode it will not it'll be watched over carefully so that the uh, that the that the it's that the products will and will be made you know come competently and that it'll, it'll be run by people who are graduates of Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh and that we felt very we liked the work uh there'll be some changes to building 74 but it'll be uh insured inside so that they meet fire department and uh other uh, agency uh, recommendations, and we approve this one eleven zero one. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gordon. Is there a motion to accept the uh, committee's recommendation? So moved, Mr. Acting Chair. Mr. Harrison, and seconded by Mr. Scala. Okay. Uh, any questions? Concerns. Okay. And I'll just uh, emphasize. Also, these are fuel cells because this is what they're making. So these are products that are again fuel cells, energy efficient fuel cells. Any uh, questions or concerns from the board members? I, does anybody have their hand up that I don't see? I'm sorry about that, folks. I'll tell you the story. Long story about that. Ms. Ms. Morales has a hand raised. Ms. Morales. Yeah, just wondering. Is this something new at the Navy Yard in recent years? Do we have, I, I, I just hear chemicals and I get concerned. Um, are there other companies that do the same? And I don't know if someone in the, from the Navy Yard is here that can, I believe. Yeah. I will say that they have been doing manufacturing. I've taken a, you know, a walk, you know, a walk, you know, I've, I've been taking on tours of the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, and they, they've been doing, uh, manufacturing of a number of uh, products, uh, even let's say those, one of the things that we were trying to do was a little, I won't even call them dog houses, but those little places where if you walk, you can put your dog inside a little place and with a credit card. So while you go shopping or whatever, the dog will be able to stay safe. I mean, they have a number of these type of things coming out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So it's in, in addition to the big work that's being uh, produced over, let's say, where the manu where they're manufacturing, but where the uh, Steiner Studios, where the filming is done, uh, they've been doing a lot of manufacturing work. Uh, you know, new products and new things that will hopefully uh, make things better. So this is, and that's one of the reasons why the Brooklyn Navy Yard is full. Uh, and they've been looking to expand areas inside there because they just cannot, at this point, accommodate all the demand for what uh, is uh, out there for these for these people, these new startup groups that want to make make things. So yeah, they've been doing this for quite some time. This is not new. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? 
Okay, hearing none, I guess we'll do a roll call with this also, Ms. Thurston. Yeah, it's up to you, H happy to do it. Yeah, yeah, let me just do it with this also, okay? Okay, perfect. All right, Ms. Ali, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Blount? Yes. Ms. Chang? Yes. Ms. Cobb? Akosua? Okay, skipper. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Einhorn? Yes. Ms. Fabush? Yes. Mr. Flanoy? Yes. Ms. Gilman? Yes. Mr. Gordon? Yes. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Mr. Howells? Yes. Ms. Hubbard coming on weary? Yes. Mr. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Lastowacki? Yes. <laughs> Ms. McKnight? Yes. Ms. Morales? Yes. Ms. Masso? Yes. Ms. Felicia? Santia? Sorry, yes. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Quint? Yes. Ms. Quint? Suzanne? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Richardson? All right. Mr. Scala? Yes. Mr. Smith? <clears throat> yes. Ms. Staten? Yes. Ms. Thompson Manning? Yes. Ms. Thurston? Yes. Ms. Ayler Gringer? Yes. Did I miss anyone? All right. Thanks, team. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I think that's unanimous, correct? OK. Thank you. OK, uh, so Mr. Gordon, uh, finally, uh, recommendations to the Landmarks Preservation Committee Commission. Okay, we're doing those. Okay. All right. The first one is 113 St. James Place. Uh, on this one, it's in the Clinton Hill Historic District, and we did approve this mm -hmm. one, 1101. Uh, it's basically a, it's, it's extent, let's say it's rear extension. Uh, which can be seen from Green Avenue. Uh, we liked the work at the rear and we felt that this was an appropriate use. It was not burdensome upon, it was not burdensome on neighbors. Uh, and in fact, in addition, uh, we received uh, uh, notices of support from the uh, Fort Green Association, the, uh, let's see, what's another one? Yes, the uh, Citizens for Responsible Planning of Fort Greene and Clinton Hill, and uh, yeah, Fort Greene and Clinton Hill, and we received also from the uh, Clinton, I think the Clinton Hill Association or Clinton Hill Group. So we, we that one we liked, uh, the community groups liked it, and we approved that one eleven zero one. Uh, the next one is one hundred Pierpont Street in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, this one is uh, for work that's being done at the facade on this one, a lot of work on the lintels and on the, uh, some of the, win you know, on the, some of the windows. Uh, they want to do some, uh, install some new bluestone uh, and some new stucco on the finishes. And basically we like the work on this one. The Brooklyn Heights Association reviewed it as well, and they liked the work, and they approved this, and we approved this one, twelve zero zero. Uh, the next one is one hundred eight Vanderbilt Avenue, uh, which is in the Wallabout Historic District. Uh, on this one, it's a one of those built. It's one of those kind of unique because it's a uh, freestanding building. With a, you know, so it's, all the sides are exposed and open, and they want to do some work uh, along the facades and then the outlet on the little part that's exposed on a little alleyway as well. Uh, there is a uh, they want to do some do some new installing on this with what they call it handy plank. It's a good, kind of a hard 
a harder version of, I guess, of wood that would uh, come, which would, you know, keep the walls and outside, you know, well done. Uh, they want to do some work on the porticos, uh, which they in. And they also do some want to do some work on when on the windows as well. Uh, that the windows would be, uh, would be uh, windows that would be acceptable to the Landmark Preservation Commission. Uh, we liked it, and we approved this one uh, eleven zero zero. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. Is there any reason why we should not put all these three together? No, we can vote. Members? Okay. All right. So um, is there a motion to accept yes. the recommendation? Hazra. Ms. Motion, to, okay. motion to accept as presented. Second. Right. Second is Mr. Smith. Okay, Ms. Ali and then Mr. Smith. Uh, any discussion on the uh, three uh, addresses? 113 St. James, 100 Pierpont, 108 Vanderbilt. Okay, if it's hearing none, uh, I don't see any. Is there somebody well, on anything? Uh, Mrs. Allegrenga? Yeah, when, when we saw the picture related to 108 Vanderbilt, it said 110 Vanderbilt. Good pick All right, I, well, I have 108 on the, uh, Mr. Okay. Gordon, do you have any? I have 108 in my notes. <laughs> I think it just happened to be the Zoom pres uh, the um the, the way they take might pictures. Be a, um, sometimes yeah, it, it might be a uh, yeah. I think it might be a one ten might be one of those uh, the secondary house number. Right. But the okay. principal my my understanding is the print well the principal we call it the principal house number or the PHN is one hundred eight Vanderbilt okay. Avenue. Thanks. Nope. That's what Any we're asking questions? for. Any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, let me ask you, is, is, any, is anybody opposed to the committee's recommendation? Any of, anybody opposed? Are there any abstentions? Okay, I don't see any. Do uh, you see any, Ms. Thurston? I do not. Okay, so that's unanimous, uh, accepting the committee's recommendation. Thank you very much. Uh, you. And before I leave, I just want to give my uh, compliments to uh, our board, fellow board member, Cyril Scala. Uh, he's been featured recently in the New York Times and on New York One for his other work that he's doing. And I just want to give him my, you know, kudos. Thank you, Gordon. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much, Gordon. Congratulations. Congratulations. It. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so for uh, elected officials, uh, the representatives of elected officials, other than assembly member Simon, council member Hudson and council member Ressler, are there any other representatives that are here? Yes, Mr. Jordan, uh, Stacey Johnson from State Senator Brian Kavanaugh's office is here. Okay. Also John, and then John Watkins from Brooklyn District Attorney Eric Gonzalez. Okay, so we have, uh, Stacy first. Sorry, Miss. Um, what's the last name? Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson, Johnson, you're, you're muted. Um, maybe we could come back to her, Mr. Watkins. Okay, Miss Watkins, and then we'll go back to Miss Johnson. Mr. Watkins, is he here? Yes, yes, I'm okay. here. There Can you hear go. me? Yes. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Very exciting and informative meeting this evening, uh, covering a lot of very important information. I'll be very brief uh, uh, considering the time. And uh, of course, foremost on most all of our minds is the uh, shooting incident, uh, unfortunately, yesterday morning uh, in Brooklyn at the 36th Street station. Uh, I live in Sunset Park, so it was very close to me, and uh, you know it's it's still quite shocking. Uh, however, uh, Brooklyn DA Gonzalez uh, was there throughout that whole episode with our other partners in law enforcement on the state, local, and even federal 
level to uh, address and to investigate this, uh, this matter. And uh, as you all are well aware of by now that that, uh, that suspect has been apprehended. And so uh, DA Gonzalez uh, just wants everyone to know that each and every day, no matter if it's serious incidents such as what happened yesterday or very minor situations, that he, along with his team of uh, ADAs, are very diligent to protect the people of Brooklyn and throughout New York City. Uh, as always, I refer you to our website, brooklynda.org, uh, and uh, especially click on the news tab. Uh, you'll see multiple uh, uh, sort of uh, stories there about the prosecutions that the DA has successfully completed and that uh, everyone in the community should, should be aware of. That's all I have for this evening. Uh, happy Passover and, and Easter to everyone, and uh, I'll see you next month. Take care now. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Uh, and is Ms. Johnson available? Ms. Johnson? Is she able to? Hey, actually, she is also, uh, <laughs> we have overlapping uh, community board meetings tonight, so she'll be back in 15 minutes. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, any other? Um, representatives of elected officials. Okay. I don't believe so. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Mueller. Uh, committees to report Economic Development and Employ Employment Committee, Mr. Flanoy. Thank you, Acting Chair Jordan. Okay. Um, the Economic Development and Employment Committee uh, had a meeting on April 5th. I want to recognize uh, Denise Peterson, my vice chair and also Catherine Gilman, my secretary. Uh, at the meeting itself, um, it was very interesting. We were looking at the uh, cannabis industry that's about to uh, become uh, not only public, but also uh, legal in New York State. And we had a long two hour discussion about that. Uh, presenters there, we have presenters from New York City Cannabis Industry Association uh, that would be with Michelle Fields, Bruce Starman, and also Kenny Mack. And we also have from uh, Minority Cannabis Business Association, uh, Amber Littlejohn. Uh, the meeting went for two hours. I'm gonna go over some of the details here. I would suggest that anyone who's interested in what's occurring with the cannabis um, laws and also uh, the, the distribution, selling, and, and also anything else in regards to cannabis to listen to that two-hour meeting. I cannot even begin to tell you how much information we went through, but I would suggest that uh, HESS, okay, and also the uh, Transportation and Public Safety both take a look at that meeting. Uh, at that meeting, uh, I asked the presenters to basically uh, talk to us as if we didn't know anything. I asked them questions about uh, the uh, detailed questions about the Marijuana Reg Regulation and Taxation Act, the Senate Bill 8084A. I also asked them about different types of uh, uh, licensing and also different types of uh, statuses that they were gonna be discussing uh, as far as the legislation. I asked them what an authorized hemp grower in good standing actually meant. I asked them about the conditional cultivative licenses, cultivator licenses. Uh, I asked them about active cannabinoid uh, hep processor licenses, uh, labor peace agreement. I asked them about the environmental stability program. I asked them about the social equity mentorship program, the uh, cultivator license. I asked them about the processor license, the distributor license. All of this is going on uh, retail dis dispensary license, cooperative license, micro business license, on-site consumptive consumption license. I asked them about the laws uh, that would impact cannabis use for employers and employees in the state. I also asked them about the difference between medical and adult usage, okay, uh, organizations uh, and the differences between them and what are the advantages and disadvantages. I also asked them about the Safe Banking Act of 2019. Uh, as many of you know, uh, because this is federally still illegal, okay, banks are not allowed to take deposits, okay, from any cannabis industries. So there's an issue because these individuals have to keep cash on hand and they cannot deposit. 
So that causes a big issue for them as far as individuals who are interested in robbing them of all this money. And where they're actually gonna put it for safekeeping. Um, I can go on with this, but basically what it came down to, and I'll yeah, answer just gonna questions. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. there's, this, this okay. is gonna continue, right? <laughs> uh, what it came down to basically is this, the cannabis industry is very competitive, okay? There are high barriers of entry, financial barriers, okay? There's gonna be lots of regulations. There's gonna be shifting legal reg uh, legislation because it's still ongoing and they're still developing this legislation. Uh, and also the other issue is that because it's still not federally uh, legal, okay, tar these individuals can be targeted for uh, federal prosecutions. Okay, so that's something else you have to look at. Uh, and one of the other things I found very interesting because they mentioned this before that the individuals would be the first ones who can get these licenses or people who have been prosecuted for marijuana, uh, whatever, uh, infractions. Okay. What they're going to be basically is this. They announced that the first 100 legal cannabis dispensary licenses will go to New Yorkers with past marijuana convictions. However, they need to prove they have a, uh, a current or past ownership of a profitable legal business with two years of financial statements. Mm. So for a lot of these individuals, that's not gonna be something that they're gonna be able to have. So there's still high barriers. I can go on with this. Um, well, you're Mr. Looking, I, I just like to ask you, we, we need to wrap it up and move forward because it looks like we have a lot of open open questions there that uh, still have to be uh, have to be answered with this legislation that comes comes through. Is that correct? Uh, I was wondering if, in fact, for instance, there's a couple of things I should let people know. OK, for instance, uh, one of the things that you're looking at is uh, for individuals who are looking to actually do uh, usage. OK, there's like, for instance, uh, medical and adult usage are different. Medical can actually move vertically. That means they can do, have all of these licenses and do all these different things. Whereas a, for an individual who's going for adult usage, you can only do one license and you cannot go vertical, it's only horizontal. So what's gonna happen is the large organizations and large corp companies are gonna have the ability to actually do everything, okay? And also have, because of that, they, they can actually have ability to actually uh, compete against the smaller individuals and force them out of business. And also they have the ability to go state and na uh, nationwide, whereas the individuals will not be able to do that. Um, I would strongly suggest also the different markets. There's so many things. One of the things also, uh, what's going to happen, and, and Hess, you should be aware of this, is it's going to be with uh, the community board is actually going to be giving out these licenses. Mm -hmm. Just like we give out licenses for liquor licenses. So they're going to be coming before the community board to ask for these licenses. So it's probably going to come to you, Hess, because it's going to be very similar to the way they do liquor licenses. So you might want to take a look at that. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Flanoy. Uh, it looks like we're going to have ample discussion about this, this, this thing when it, when it finally gets... Uh, when do you anticipate this to be uh, coming to the community board? Uh, well, the thing is this, we are going to probably be looking at this for the next couple of months. Uh, if okay. anyone has any questions about some of the licensing, okay, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, as far as licensing, about the ability to license, about the different legislation and everything else that goes with this. So if anyone has any questions at all, you can ask them right now. All right, we, 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 I don't want to get into a whole lot of questions about stuff that we probably don't even have a, have a, you know, have a lot of knowledge about. So uh, can we do that offline? Well, you have two hands raised. Well, <laughs> I'll just add from a point of order perspective, the question uh -huh. should be specific to Mr. Flory's report about what happened at the meeting. We did not have this topic on the agenda. It's obviously a hot topic, so we should right. please reserve yeah. I just have a comment, Mr. Chairman. Not, not a, a, just a comment okay. for the for the board. I, yes, I think we had a we had a terrific meeting. I really think it behooves the community board in general, both the Hess Committee and the Transportation Public Safety, 
to work together with the economics committee and look into this whole thing because these issues are gonna come up uh, to the Hess committee and then they're gonna to come to the general committee and we really should be educated as to this law so that we know what we're doing when we do vote on it. Thank you. I agree, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the comment, Mr. Skell. Okay, thank you, Mr. Flanoy, for a very detailed uh, report also. Uh, uh, we're still hand raised here. I just have one quick thing. I'm so sorry. I know we're trying to move this along, but as soon as this came up um, a couple weeks ago, I knew that this was going to be something that people thought should come to the Hess committee. And I have to say, I have a lot of concerns about the Hess committee having another set of licenses that they have to approve. I think that liquor licenses already take up a huge amount of time of that of that committee. And in order to be able to conduct business outside of licenses, I wonder if they're maybe at the executive committee at some point when this is actually coming down, we could discuss other ways besides this coming through Hess. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see. I'm not saying that the, we're not making a determination that it's gonna come through Hess, all right? But I think we should have a, a, a larger discussion and then determine how we're gonna handle the situation. I'd like Mr. Singletary to be able to weigh in on it also, okay? Absolutely, uh, just voicing a concern early in the process. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, no problem. Uh, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Smith now has his hand raised. Mr. Smith. Good evening. Um, as the chair of Hess, I, I feel like my committee has been mentioned quite uh, a lot in this meeting, particularly in regards to cannabis. Um, I think uh, it's important to recognize that the chair and the board of office sets out guidelines for which committees should get different topics. Um, I, I don't have a strong objection to having liquor light or to have having cannabis licenses come to my committee. Um, but I, I would like to have further discussion about it. I, I've raised the issue to the chair and I, I've told I'm told that there's that there hasn't been a decision made about it yet. So that's where we are, and I think we should leave it to the chair to figure out where these matters should be given. And if it is to my committee, then by all means, let it go to my committee. But I don't know if it needs to have three or four different committees deciding this issue on the community board, because just in my committee alone, we have issues of health, maternal health, um, climate change, so uh, sanitation, uh, homelessness, and liquor licenses. And, and, and uh, we also have some issues about nutrition that come up as well too. And being able to have all of those topics get enough space is, is a bit of a challenge um, as Lindsay alluded to. So whatever we agree to work out, I, I just feel like we should let the appropriate people decide. Okay, thank you. We really noted, and I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, and certainly the chair has to be involved with it and the board office, as you mentioned. Mr. So uh, thank you so much, Mr. Flanoy, though. Uh, you know, certainly that's on the radar. Um, finance and personnel, I'm, I'm on there. I'm the chair of the finance and personnel. Mr. Jordan? Yes. I am so sorry. We have so many elected officials visiting us this evening. Um, could we please recognize Ms. Stacy Johnson from Mr. Kavanaugh's office, who is also um, okay. trying to do two I, meetings I, tonight? All right. Well, let me just I, I, I just say this one thing, and then we'll get to Ms. Johnson. Um, I really don't. We'll, we're going to be meeting on April 28th, um, and we probably will just be talking about the budget and uh, some of the personnel issues. So um, I don't have anything to report for this uh, uh, for this meeting. So now we'll go to Ms. Johnson uh, from uh, Mr. Um, State Senator Brian Kavanaugh's office. Ms. Johnson. Yeah, hi, thanks for the opportunity to introduce myself and say hello. Um, I'm a new community liaison in Brian's office and I'll be taking over the Brooklyn portion. Um, so for your community board area that includes like the waterfront, um, and the, I did watch the last meeting that you had just so I could sort of get some context. I noticed you had a long discussion about AMI levels. So just letting you know that I'm here to pay attention to your issues um, can, and can connect you to Brian Kavanaugh's office. He gave me some information about the budget. I realize you heard a lot of it already from Assemblywoman um, Joanne Simon, 
Um, I'll go into a few things that, that Senator Kavanaugh highlighted. Um, he highlighted the fact that the, it's $4 million more than last year's budget. So the $220 million is um, $4 million more than last year. He's celebrating the amount of money that goes into the budget for homeowners, homeless New Yorkers and renters. That's $8 billion total. Um, some of the breakdowns, just cherry picking some of the highlights, 1.5 billion for supportive housing, 1 billion for new construction of rental housing, um, 800 million in new state funds for the ERAP program. So that was mentioned earlier, but really important to, um, to apply um, if you haven't already, if someone needs it. Um, the application, even if you don't get the money, helps you um, with some legal protections to stay in your apartment if you're facing eviction. So if you haven't applied or you know someone who hasn't applied, um, tell them to do that right away. Um, there's also 100 million, which will now create 200 million for Honda, which is to convert hotels to affordable housing. Um, the rest of it was mentioned um, by Assemblywoman Joanne Simon. Um, so I'll skip most of those details, but um, the Senator also wanted to say he was disappointed that he couldn't get his housing access voucher program into the, into the budget, but he will remain um, diligent fighting for that in the future. Um, and there were also some legislative priorities that were not discussed in the budget process, but they will be included in upcoming weeks of legislation, uh, including the All Electric Buildings Act. So. Um, I'll put my information in the chat and I'm your new liaison and I'm happy to be here and really good to see such a robust community. Um, and I'll hope, hopefully be visiting your neighborhood soon. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Um, we're gonna move on to committees to report. Uh, Ms. Zellagrenga for Parks and Recreation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, earlier, we really have two meetings to report on, uh, given the way the month went. Uh, so first, I wanted to thank Andrew Lastowecki, my uh, co-chair, and I wanted to thank um, Sabrina Rezzi and Lenny Leventon for taking the minutes at these two meetings. Our, we just met on Monday, and the presenter was the New York City Runs Brooklyn Marathon and Half Marathon. And uh, this is taking place on uh, April 24th. It's the 10th year and they expect, they have 20,000 people who have signed up to run. Um, you should be, if you're interested in it, you, it starts at around 7 a.m. the first runners start and you can see it from um, many different um, places within CB2. Um, just note that some streets may be closed, some uh, parking spaces may be gone. So um, we always want to be good neighbors and support an event like this. And um, I think this is the first time it's being held in two years and the numbers participating have skyrocketed since the last time they held it. So um, those of you who are interested in running uh, might like to to go out and see it or perhaps join the organization at some point. We met on uh, in March, on March 21st, and we had our friends group roundtable. Uh, we had representatives from Brooklyn Bridge Park. We had uh, representatives from the Friends of Hillside Dog Park. And as you know, that um, dog parks and dog runs continue to be a major issue of focus in the district, uh, we heard from the Friends of Commodore Barry Park and uh, Fort Greene Park Conservancy. And both of those venues have seen the beginnings of holding live in-person events, which obviously they didn't hold for quite a while. Of particular interest in Fort Greene has been a pilot project um, reaching out to uh, people who frequent the park who might have mental or other health issues and trying to assist them and, and get them connected to services. And the program so far has been successful in reaching a number of people and they're hoping to expand it. We heard again from Fort Greene Tennis Association, uh, the Friends of South Oxford Park. Uh, this is a, a particularly interesting park because they have a very active friends group and the friends group is responsible for opening and closing the park every day. 
So they're really committed. Um, we've heard them before. They're interested in, in, um, in, in enhancing the turf that they have. And um, you already brought a, a concern of theirs to the parks uh, department. Uh, they, they have an automatic sprinkler in the summer that doesn't seem to go off at all. So we've already brought that matter to the attention of the parks. And then we heard from both Brooklyn Pickleball and the New York City Bike Polo Club. And I think our committee is very um, justifiably proud that we've given both of these organizations an opportunity to network and connect and get their message out. They both have some, the same problem, finding the, a, a dedicated space where they can, um, they can, uh, you know, play bike polo or pickleball. And they've also been looking to the roller hockey leagues. And I think we've been somewhat instrumental in getting them together and trying, they're trying to see if they can identify some space that they could all utilize. So stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, and then we also heard uh, Susan Smith McKinney Stewart Park, which is slated to open very shortly and which is formerly known as Brooklyn uh, Park 2, Brooklyn Bridge, uh, Brooklyn Park, uh, Bridge Park 2 rather. Um, our own member, Suzanne Quint, has been very influential in helping them get a friends group started. So we'll be hearing from them. It's, it should be a lovely new park with a variety of offerings. So um, if you have any questions, um, otherwise, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Zellegringa. And uh, next on the agenda is, I don't see Mr. Mike. So Mr. Quint, are you uh, reporting for the Transportation and Public Safety Committee? Yes, yes. Yes, I will, Leonard, thank you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Meyer's not here. Uh, our um, next meeting is tomorrow. Normally it would be a week from tomorrow, but because of the holidays, our date has moved up. So anybody who would have expected we were meeting on the third Thursday, the meeting is tomorrow. And uh, if you need, contact the board for the Zoom connection. The meeting in March uh, was the, we, we had, uh, the meeting tomorrow is uh, <clears throat> probably most interesting because of uh, piggybacks on what uh, Council Member Hudson talked about, and that's open streets, uh, Willoughby Avenue open streets, but not just, uh, not just Willoughby Avenue, there will be discussion of open streets generally, and we will have a representative from the Department of Transportation. And uh, th that same representative was with us on uh, last month. And we talked about uh, red light cameras, traffic cameras, um, raised sidewalks. And we talked about um, uh, um, one other issue with the Department of Transportation. But now we're getting ready uh, to at our meetings and we expect to explore a lot more issues. We will have open streets will be a big topic tomorrow. And we also heard on the public safety side last month from uh, three representatives of NYPD who are involved with the PSA3, which is the uh, bureau that um, patrols the uh, NYCHA sites within our community board. And we heard from two of the COs who are on the, um, literally on the street. And we heard from uh, the community uh, liaison from PSA3. So that's it. We'll be on tomorrow. Please join us. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Quint. Uh, next up uh, for Youth Education and Cultural Affairs, Ms. Feibusch. Hi, good evening. Uh, in our March meeting, we heard from the Citizens Committee for Children. Their focus is on early care and education. They have a huge amount of uh, data on child and family well-being. Some of it is citywide, uh, community district, zip code. So there's a lot to mine through and we will be using some of this information for our, as we develop the um, statement of district needs. Uh, in, we learned that the cost burden for early care is, uh, most challenging for single parents. And this was an area that stood out in our, in the analysis of our district's um, information. 
Uh, there are also a lot of issues around, we know that the care for the four-year-olds, the UPK, the uh, four-year-olds that are being uh, educated in schools and now the uh, 3K program, that they're not as well enrolled as they should be. So in other words, public funds are paying for these services but because this, it's aligned to the school day, the vacation calendar and the school year, many parents are not enrolling their children in the 3K. So there's an advocacy uh, effort to align uh, the, the calendars and the schedules so that parents can utilize these services as well as advocacy for uh, childcare for children for pe whose parents work different hours than you know the typical nine to five that we think about because parents work all sorts of um, hours and days. Uh, so the, the citywide effort is around uh, affordable care uh, for the young children. So that is basically what we focused on last month. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Feinbush. Uh, that ends uh, committee reports. And uh, now we'll go to our city agencies and community partners. Uh, so Ms. Mueller, do we have a, a list of folks that are lined up? We do. Uh, our friends from the Brooklyn Public Library have a big announcement to share with us, followed by uh, Ethan Mulligan from Brooklyn Navy Yard. I believe Ellen from BAM has stepped off the call. Stephen Williams from Accessible Dispatch and Zach Martin from Trellis. Okay. And the so we'll stop. And the we'll regular. Stop. Yeah, we, we have you. We, we're going to get to tomorrow. you. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, uh, we'll start with the library, Brooklyn Public Library. Yes. And uh, thank you, uh, Taya, for that teaser. Um, I will uh, be quick. Uh, I'm here with my colleagues Tracy Mantrone from Clinton Hill Library and Rachel Tiemann from Brooklyn Heights Library. Um, I'm going to uh, just really quickly mention uh, that uh, the Brooklyn Library, uh, you may have heard this piece on NPR, um, has started the Books Unbanned project um, to uh, increase uh, our support of books uh, that are being challenged in school and uh, other libraries uh, throughout the nation, um, including giving teens across our nation a chance to write to us uh, to say uh, uh, to get access to our collect our ebook collection. Um, so that they have access to materials. The Brooklyn Public Library supports the right to read, the freedom to read, and intellectual freedom. Um, in other news, uh, summer reading is around the corner, so save the date for June 4th. Um, and uh, uh, Tracy's going to speak a little bit more on this, uh, but I'm also going to share um, our event calendar at Adam Street Library here in Dumbo. And again, come visit. Um, my name is Kat and the uh, managing librarian there. Um, and we have a lot of uh, great weekly programs uh, for people of all ages. Um, so please check that out at your leisure. And I'm going to toss it over to Tracy. Yes, Brooklyn Public Library has expanded their services. We are now doing indoor programming for people of all ages, kids as well as adults. Our meeting rooms are open. You can use our restrooms and we're giving out free COVID tests, um, two per household member. You don't need to show ID or a library card. You just go over to the info desk and ask for your COVID tests. Clinton Hill is having its first out time, outdoor story time tomorrow at 11 a.m. We'll be doing story time outdoors on Thursdays in front of the library now that the weather is getting nicer and we'll be expanding to additional outdoor programs. In May and June, we're gonna be doing outdoor craft programs for adults. I'm gonna be putting information in the chat for that. We have five programs that um, you need to pre-register for. For story time, you can just come. And now I'm gonna turn um, the meeting over to Rachel. Hi, thank you, Tracy. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Tiemann. I'm the um, library managing librarian for the Brooklyn Heights Library. And I have some very good news I'd like to share with everyone. Um, it's been a long time coming, but the Brooklyn Heights Library is expected to open this June. Uh, 
I am incredibly excited. My staff is excited. I know the community will be excited. Uh, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. It's 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 beautiful. I've seen um, I've seen it um, in bits and pieces. It's um, it's going to have its own children's floor, an adult floor. It's swimming in shells. We're going to have books for days. We're going to have a teen floor, which the Brooklyn Heights community has never had. Our YA librarian is beside herself. Uh, I hope to see everyone who's here at this meeting come by and say hello. We'll be sharing more definitive information as it becomes available, but we are having several outreach events uh, surrounding our opening, many of them around Cadman Plaza. We'll let you know more about that as those are booked, but I am just so excited to be able to actually share an opening time and let you all know that the Brooklyn Heights Library will be back in business um, in its full glory. So I just wanted to share all of that tonight. Uh, just a quick shout out about an incubator lab that we're doing with Brooklyn Heights Library, just because our application um, due date is coming up soon. But it's a program called you Ask, I Tell, and it's a partnership with Poetic Theater Productions, their Veterans Voices program, and it's a nod to the Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, military policy that existed for many years for LGBTQ military personnel. And in this um, program, we'll be pairing with um, curated facilitators, six LGBTQ veterans, six LGBTQ young adults who will interview each other and find out about shared experiences they may have, learn from each other and together with their partnership after an eight week uh, workshop series, it will end in a performance where they will do a spoken word or poetry that they've written together about their interviews and their experiences together. And they'll be doing that live in person at our new branch. Um, and another thing I just wanted to share that the Center for Brooklyn History, a merger with Bro Brooklyn uh, Historical Society and Brooklyn Public Library is continuing. They'll be opening um, soon and um, it's, uh, there's many class visits that they'll, they'll be starting to have. And I'm gonna drop a link for these uh, one-off visit requests. The Brooklyn Connection is the education team's signature partnership program. And the Center for Brooklyn History uh, connects students and educators to all kinds of archives, collections, and events. Um, so I'll drop all of the links and the links to the application for our incubator lab and that's due April 18th so that's coming up soon so if you have an LGBTQ veteran or an LGBTQ young adult that you know of who would be interested please share this widely with them and looking forward to seeing you all in June thank you so much hey thank you so much good news uh, I think we have next the is it Navy Yard next Yes, hi, thank you, Acting Chair Jordan. Um, my report is not gonna be as exciting as uh, the Brooklyn Public Library. It's always hard to follow them, but today is uh, especially hard. Um, I am going to, through the course of, as I talk, drop three links into the chat. Um, there'll be more information on everything I talk about in those links, but if you have any additional questions, I will put my email as the fourth thing, because um, there are some things you might wanna follow up with me separately. Um, so feel free to email me um, with any additional questions or if you want to take advantage of any of the resources I talk about. Um, at the yard, we talk about a, a pyramid of engagement. So at the lower level, you might come to the yard as a kid for a class trip or one of our family programs that our exhibits and programs team puts on. Then you may come, let's say as a high school student, come to the CTE, to the STEAM Center High School then you could possibly get an internship while still in high school or while you're in college, we have our college internship program. Eventually you would hopefully be hired by one of the 500 companies at the yard and be working there. And then the very top of that is you would own your own business on the yard. Um, so I'm gonna talk in reverse order today and just talk about three events that come down that pyramid. Um, so at the top level, owning your own business at the yard, especially as a, ma a manufacturer or a designer or um, um, somebody that makes things. Um, again, not as exciting as the Brooklyn Public Library, but we are, we're having our first ever spring market. And I'm just going to drop the link in the chat for the programs page, and you can check there. That's going to be Saturday and Sunday, May 21st and 22nd. So if you've ever been to our annual holiday market, uh, this is going to be a great way to do it in the spring. You come to Building 77 between 12 and 5, there's going to be over 30 vendors in there. Again, all types of manufacturing designers, 
uh, sustainable things, handmade jewelry, one of a kind home decor pieces, rare fashion. Um, so we're mostly, um, and if you've ever been to the holiday market, which I hope you all have been, there's always food uh, and drink and music. So those will all be there as well. Um, and it'll be mostly in building 77, but there'll be some folks in, in the lot behind the building as well. Uh, it's going to be mostly yard folks, um, but there is uh, there may be some slots open for local vendors. Um, so I'll, again, I'll put my email at the end and um, I can send you to fill out the form. And if you're, the vendor fits perfectly with the mix. Um, so just filling it out is no guarantee, but I just wanted to give you that option. Um, um, so we will I will talk to you again right before that spring market. Uh, so I will be hitting you in May with that same information. Um, coming back down a little more uh, to getting that job on the yard, I talk about the employment center um, a lot. Um, so I'm going to put the link again um, to our uh, for our information sessions. They are still twice weekly. They're on Tuesdays. The 10 a.m. session is now in person. That's been since March 29th. So you can come to Building 92. Um, that's at 10 a.m. Uh, we, we suggest you arrive at 945 because the doors do close at 10 a.m. sharp. Um, and then there is a 2 p.m. virtual session. So two sessions on Tuesdays, um, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, and on that page, you can also check out the types of jobs that are currently available um, with yard businesses. Um, and there's a second thing on, on the employment and training part of the pyramid I just wanted to talk about, and that is tomorrow um, at Building 92 um, from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Um, there's a labor union information session. Uh, we're partnering with the New York. Oh, thank you. This is great. Um, Taya, you're the best. Um, uh, so here's the flyer. This is also available on the community board to social media pages, including Twitter and Facebook. Um, so again, this is the first one. It's tomorrow, um, but there will be weekly ones coming up. So stay tuned for more. Um, no RSVP required. Um, we just ask you come uh, 10 minutes prior to the start time. So 11.50 a.m. mask up. Um, and the district council and ourselves, uh, they'll offer information on these unions uh, at the yard, including the carpenters union, as you can see, and the non-traditional employment for women, the new um, and each week there'll be different um, unions being featured. Um, this is not, uh, I must say, like a, an, a guaranteed pathway to a union job. Um, but it, if you come to the information session, um, you'll learn about uh, the career trajectories of each of these unions, as well as access points and training opportunities um, with agencies that lead to the union. Um, thank you, Tay, that was super helpful. Um, and then just coming one more step uh, back down um, the pyramid. I'm going to just put one more link in the chat. Um, so as we talked about um, young folks or whatever you define as young, in this case, we're defining as 15 to 19 years old. Um, we're having, these are called emerging designer tours. So these are folks 15 to 19 who might be interested in, in a career in design. Um, this is part of uh, we have multiple programs running with NYC by Design, which is May 10th to May 20th um, this year. Um, so these emerging designer tours, um, this is on Saturday, May 14th. You'll see the link is to an Eventbrite um, and the, I'm just making sure I went through, link is to the Eventbrite. It's, it, it starts Friday. You can start signing up on Friday. Um, so two sessions on that day, Saturday, May 14th. Kids 15 and 19 come to the yard, actually get to go inside businesses here of people who do design work. And then the tour will culminate at the STEAM Center um, at the CTE High School so they can see inside there as well, especially for the younger kids. Um, if they go to high school at the feeder schools in the local community that go to STEAM. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention and no link for this, um, I'm just gonna type my email in now while I'm talking. Um, I talked in March about, um, we're having a curriculum development uh, focus groups um, for those school tours I mentioned. They're for kids three to uh, grades three to five and we're redoing the curriculum. So we're looking for educators to come in, be part of these focus groups and help us um, develop the new curriculum for uh, those tours. Um, so if you're an educator or you know someone who is, uh, we'll take anywhere from grade two to six, even though it's focused on three to five, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Those sessions are gonna be on April 26th and April 28th. 
Um, I don't have details on what exactly we provide at the focus groups, but I imagine at least coffee and pastries. Um, and you get a chance to come to the yard and um, I can always go to and, and provide a short tour. Um, so thanks for your time tonight. Um, and I'll see you all again in person or for the first time in person. I was, I came on while we were remote. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mulligan, uh, for your report. Uh, next will be uh, Mr. Morrow from the Red Cross. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Morrow, and I'm the Greater New York Red Cross Community Relations Ambassador for Community Port 2. Around the country, there are presently 44 disaster relief operations. 34 are in the midsection of our country. All are climate change related. This week, locally, we assisted 92 adults and 18 children following 30 relief operations. Nationally, our attention has been on the situation in the Ukraine, and yet climate-induced disasters are still happening here and around the world. Recently, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has published its 2022 report on the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability of climate change globally. It covers in detail, one, the observed and projected impact and risk regionally, covering 79 years from 2021 to 2100. Two, the adaptation measures and enabling conditions, both for the present and the future. Three, climate resilient development, suggesting methods for achieving climate resilience. This is a valuable resource. Let me put it in the chat right now. This is a valuable resource and one that is important to read and get to our elected representatives. I have attached a copy of the report in the, in the chat. Our community board should insist that our elected officials deal more with urban development rather than for-profit development. A reminder, the Red Cross virtual programs can help you and our community. Our courses are free. Please check out our website, redcross.org, for details and to view our programs. It's always an honor and privilege for me to speak with you. Have a joyous and healthy holiday season. Thank you very much, Mr. Morrow. Uh, now, Mr. Williams from Accessible Dispatch. Hi, folks. Mine is very brief. I'm Stephen Williams with the Accessible Dispatch Program. This is a program that connects the community to wheelchair accessible taxis all throughout the five boroughs of New York City. It's a perfect program for elderly and for people who have disabilities, specifically people who are in wheelchairs. Um, the service is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, these are regular taxi cabs. The only thing is that they're larger than a regular taxi cab. Uh, and they have a driver who's trained to assist people in and out of the vehicle very safely. And the drivers are trained in wheelchair securement, which is really great. Um, you can access the service by um, calling our 24 hour call center or by going to our website or by downloading our app onto our smartphone and you pay the same fare as a regular New York City cab, even though you're getting a larger car and specialized service from a driver. Uh, and I will definitely um, put my information in the chat and I will email your um, your district manager some more information so we can share with all of you tomorrow. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Uh, yes, definitely. We would I'd like to have that information. Um, now, Mr. Martin from Trellis. How's it going, everybody? Uh, I'll be brief. Um, just a couple things. One, I'm representing Trellis and Recovery House of Worship. So the first is, um, my organization Trellis is organizing a letter of support in reference to the two shelters that are gonna be introduced into the community, 316 Atlantic and one Hoyt Street. Uh, we are trying to um, get garner uh, support for a coalition of welcoming committee um, residents for, of support to make sure that we're on the same page. We're working with the Open Hearts Initiative that um, introduced this same sort of group up in, at the Lucerne in the Upper West Side. They've created some really great resources already. So we've uh, worked with them for the last number of months to create um, just our letter and some resources that we'll be providing for folks who wanna be a part of the welcoming committee um, to uh, welcome residents and to be supportive uh, organizations and individuals as um, our houseless brothers and sisters are welcomed into these facilities. So um, the letter is um, in the chat box. So you can find out more information about how to just participate in that. If you have any questions, we're going to be adding the 316 uh, Atlant Atlantic um, shelter um, to that letter as well, because we believe that both are, are necessary resources um, and facilities 
as we address the issue of homelessness in our city and particularly in our in our uh, community district. Uh, just a couple things related to our recovery house of worship. So you're welcome to join us for our Good Friday service and our Easter Sunday service. And during that time, we'll be introducing that we are becoming Next Step Community Church. Uh, we are transitioning our name on Sunday um, as we've worked over the last year to change the name of our church, realizing that when we say recovery house of worship, certain people feel like they don't belong in the space, but we've been a church that welcomes any, everyone from the beginning. So we have transitioned um, to becoming Next Step Community Church, and that will be as of Sunday. Information will be um, on our website and on our, all of our social media. You can find out more information by just looking for Next Step Community Church. And then just letting you know, again, we have our shower program that we run every Tuesday um, from 10 to noon. We have a, a mobile shower truck that shows up in partnership with the Seventh-day Adventist organization and the Bowery Mission to provide showers for houseless individuals or those in shelter who don't feel safe in their showers at their facilities. Um, so we are always welcoming people to come and access the services there. We also provide toiletries and clothing on Tuesdays as part of that shower program. You can find out more about how to support the program by helping to provide clothing, toiletry kits, or financial support to make that ministry and organization possible on Tuesdays. Again, by all the information is on our website that I'll make sure to put in the chat box. And also just to let you know that as part of our breakfast that happens Monday, Tuesday, and Friday from 9 to 1030, we also have a social service help desk where over the last two years, we've been providing opportunity to get people um, the free federal cell phone program, get them signed up for that, get their food stamp set up, get them a replacement identification. We've signed up probably close to 20 folks to get um, at IDNYC's uh, re replacement driver's licenses, a bunch of other resources. Um, this is run by volunteers also. So if you'd like to come and help with our social service help desk, we also always welcome volunteers, no experience necessary as people come into our space to receive the help um, that they need um, off the street. So again, I'll put my um, information in the chat box. Um, we are glad to be part of CB2 and all that's happening in the community. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Okay, thank you. And, and pardon me, uh, Pastor Martin. I called you Mr. Martin, Pastor Martin. Okay, thank it's you. All right, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, all right, uh, now we'll go on to, uh, I think we're finished with all the city agencies and community partners. Uh, any other board business? Okay, hearing none, uh, we're gonna start with our community forum. So that's for individuals who would like to speak to the board. I think there's a two minute uh, time limit for that and, um, and any other new business that we might have. So um, do we have a, uh, uh, Ms. Mueller, do we have a, um, a list of anybody that signed up? Uh, Pastor Martin, is your hand up from previously or you have new business? New business? Uh, I believe he's the only one. Okay. All right, Pastor Martin. Yeah, so I just wanted to follow up. I, I saw on the, um, the renewals of the liquor licenses that Applebee's is back on there. So I don't know in terms of when that was um, presented, are they, are they reopening? And my question specifically then is related to if they are planning on reopening, how they plan to address the homeless encampment that's surrounded their facility over the last year and a half. Um, I have a vested interest in making sure they do that carefully and well. So it was news to me that they are renewing their license. I didn't think they were coming back. So I was just curious as to where that was in terms of what they presented in terms of potentially reopening. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of words about that. I believe that the committee was just addressing the uh, the uh, granting of the liquor license. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think they, you know, Mr. Smith, you can, you know, if you have any other additional information. I think I might be able to add a point of order, which might help uh, Pastor Martin here. Uh, Pastor Martin, are, are you referring to the, the, the Applebee's that was there on Flatbush Avenue and um decalb or the applebee's that's in the atlantic terminal oh it's a good question so i i had assumed it was the one on decalb so we're, we're talking about the one that's in the in one terminal. that came before our committee was the one in the atlantic terminal so perhaps that might answer your question that okay. that answers my question so that yeah no further comment necessary yeah okay very good uh thank you mr smith and uh i guess 
no more business before this board. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move, Mr. Acting Chair. Okay, thank Second. you. Mr. Yeah. Seconded by Mr. Gordon. Uh, oh, Mr. Scala, did you have something to say? No, I didn't. I was just seconding. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, as, as, as always, when Mr. Singleton, well, never mind. I'm not going to make that comment. All right. Uh, we've gone on for a long time. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. We had a very good meeting. Uh, good night. So, oh, good so night. Much. Job, Leonard. Good night.